Uh, good morning. Welcome to the 10th meeting of 2018 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. We have apologies from Stuart Stevenson, MSP, and we've been joined by a substitute member of the committee, Joan McAlpine. Can I ask Joan McAlpine to declare whether she has any relevant interests? I have no relevant interests, convener. Okay, thank you. Uh, before we move to the first item on the agenda, I'd like to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices, as these may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take item five in private. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The second item on the agenda is to take evidence on the environmental implications for Scotland of the UK leaving the EU from both Rosanna Cunningham, Cabinet Secretary for the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, and Michael Russell, Minister for UK Negotiations on Scotland's place in Europe. And the ministers are accompanied by officials Kate Thompson McDermott, Ian Jardin, Ewan Page, and Julie Steele. We move directly to questions. Um, can I ask for the Scottish Government's view of the policy area, areas that the UK Government says are reserved? <laughs> Mr Russell. Uh, um, well, uh, we dispute um, some of those. I think the history of uh, this needs to be put in context, convener. The discussions on the areas of intersection between the EU, EU competence and competence for the, this uh, parliament uh, have been going on for some considerable time, in fact, since last summer. Um, by last December, we had hammered out a list, this list of 111 items, which was divided into three sections. And I, I'm sorry to repeat this, but it puts a context of where we now are. Those <coughs> three sections <coughs> included a number of items which no further action was required, a number of items which there would be non-legislative solutions, some of which, many of which were already in place, things like memoranda of understanding or normal ways of working, and a list of 24 or 25, depending on your definition, of items that might require legislative frameworks, and that's, that was the, the, the problematic list, essentially, although you know, we would maintain that agreement was required for all those things. That none decisions on those matters, even if they were out of scope, shouldn't be made by the UK government. They should be made by the devolved administration. Um, there were, therefore, up until two weeks ago, just three categories. Um, however, um, three, uh, two weeks ago, a paper was produced which was not shown to the two relevant ministers, that's to myself and Mark Drakeford, um, but entered into discussion at the a meeting of the JMC without us seeing it, and therefore it was impossible for us to discuss it because we didn't know what we were discussing. And this paper had a fourth category, and that fourth category contained a, a list of items which uh, the UK government now said were reserved, and therefore were out with a scope for any of this discussion. Decisions had been made, and they wouldn't be uh, even uh, talked about any further. Well, we've now looked at that list, and our initial analysis, and I stress it's an initial analysis, is that the classification of state aid, timber trade rules, and protected food names uh, could be and will be contested. Uh, so therefore, we don't accept that this list is accurate. State aids is a, a very interesting part of that, because uh, the state aid issue has always been one which was dealt with by the UK, but always been dealt with on the basis of uh, Scottish and Welsh and Northern Irish administration of the rules for those areas. Uh, what appears to be now uh, suggested is that there would be a single UK system that would only be administered by the UK, which would, in this, this context, be judge and jury in its own case, because we would be dealing with state aid rules that were set by the UK for the UK, and therefore, if there was any dispute about them, it would be the UK decided. Now, that may sound strange, but actually it's how the JMC operates, and that any complaint under the, the great process of the JMC, in the end, ends up with the UK government, who says, you know, nothing to see here, move along. Um, so we will have to, and will, dispute that. So we don't accept this. We think it should be a matter for discussion. This list has to go back into discussion as part of the discussions that are taking place. And have you had any feedback from the UK government on uh, that desire on your part? There has been no formal discussion of this because, as I say, it was entered into discussion two weeks ago, in fact, ten days ago, without any discussion with us. So now there needs to be formal discussion of it. Our officials are starting that process. But uh, we don't get any indication that there's any flexibility in it as yet. But we couldn't accept this list. And we couldn't accept that process where you know, these decisions are simply made. Okay. Talking about further discussion, there are 24 policies 
areas that would require or may require legislative arrangements, and we'll have to that will have to be worked through. Uh, how do you envisage agreement being reached on whether a framework is necessary? How, what form do you envisage that taking? And what happens if there's a difference of view? Uh, these, are, these are well rehearsed positions, and, and obviously you know, we've talked about that substantially in, in, in recent weeks. Um, let's accentuate the positive. We started um, last July with the view from the UK government that all these items, every item on the list, and remember this is their list of intersections, all those items would go to Westminster and then there would be in some unspecified time period uh, some unspecified action which would result in some of these coming back by agreement. Uh, we, and we and the Welsh of course refused to accept that. We are now in the position where the official position of the UK government, as I understand it, is that the only areas of contention are these 24. However, they have reserved the right to add to that list at any time should a new item you know, drift into their consciousness. And I mean, this has been a major discussion, that simply there could be something that they suddenly realise they want to have on a list and they put it on this list. But ostensibly, this is a list which now requires that the final list of the 24 or 25, the December list had 25 items on it. The present list is slightly different, and the analysis of that I've um, put out uh, to, to members. This is a list in which we say there could be um, a, uh, the need for legislative frameworks. There has been a deep dive exercise on all of these issues, and indeed on some other issues too, which is bringing together officials from Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, uh, and the UK to discuss what type of framework might be necessary or required, whether it should be a legislative framework, whether you could have the continuation or intensification of present methods of operation, or whether there is something else that needs to be done. And I'll give you an example. In um, agricultural support, clearly the UK government is planning an agriculture bill. And therefore, one would expect, that as a process of developing that bill, a framework for agricultural support in these islands would be part of that bill. That bill would require our involvement in, in putting it together, it would require, and it would require legislative consent. So that's quite clear. In fishing, it's not quite so clear. Taking, taking aside the, the present situation. But in fishing, it's not quite so clear because there are existing arrangements that operate um, a, 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 on a, essentially a collaborative basis where there is work that's done between the administrations. And therefore, whether there is to be a fisheries bill, we know that, but whether that fisheries bill would contain a new set of legislative frameworks or whether it would seek the continuation of the present informal arrangements, we, wouldn't, uh, we would really have to discuss that. But the point here is willing entry into discussion. If the UK government says, these are the items we think should form the basis of frameworks, and we were to agree, and I don't think it would be difficult to find that agreement, and say, will you now agree that that is the case, saying to us and to the Welsh, and now let us work our way together to seeing how this happens with a formal structure and with a dispute resolution procedure? Interestingly, there was an amendment in the House of Lords yesterday, which, of course, none of which were voted on, but there's an amendment from Lord Mackay of Clash Fern, which begins to tackle this issue. Um, and I've talked to James Mackay about his amendment um, and about the process we're going through. And he has very acutely, of course, as he would, seen that the issue is, first of all, a structure of getting consent, and secondly, a structure for resolving different difficulties in which if consent cannot be found. Now, I don't agree with the particular solution he has put in place, particularly on the second part, but I do think that's an important contribution, and it builds on the work of the Welsh Government in uh, last August, who published a paper on the issue of relationships within these islands, because you know, it will come as no surprise to this committee that I believe that Scotland should be independent. But even if I do believe that, and I do, and others believe it too, there will need to be some sort of structure that governs relationships between the, the nations of these islands with an independent Scotland, let alone a devolved Scotland. How do we reach that? And the Welsh have put forward some interesting ideas, ideas about a sort of council of the isles, a, a way in which we could work together on uh, issues of agriculture and fisheries and the environment and elsewhere and, and other subjects. And we begin to have those discussions and the Welsh want to have those discussions and clearly members of the House of Lords are waking up to that but the UK government doesn't want to have those discussions. It wants to continue with the present situation, the JMC, and it dominating the situation. And that's not acceptable. So how will the impasse be broken? I have, 
I was about to say no idea. I have lots of ideas. I have lots of ideas, but I am not sure how it will be broken. We will continue to discuss. There are ideas such as the ones being discussed in the House of Lords. The basic principle cannot be avoided. I mean, that's, that's the, at the heart of it. The basic principle of ensuring there is consent or agreement for the use of the powers that are in the control of the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Parliament by extension, the Scottish and Welsh people, cannot be uh, overridden. But if that principle of consent, the recognition of the existing devolution settlement, that's all it is, that if the recognition of the existing devolution settlement is given by the UK government, then there is a way forward. And that's by negotiation, and these frameworks fit into that, and we move forward in that way, and legislative consent is given to the bill. If there is, that is not the case, then we will move forward uh, uh, by having our own bill, which I hope we will pass this week, by having the UK bill, and finding a way between those two bills to ensure that these frameworks operate. Some way or another, we've got to make something work. But the, the best and easiest route is presently being resisted by the UK government. The other route will be harder, but I think we will, we will simply have to do it. And, and what you've just said, does that also cover, in general, a general sense, the policy areas where non-legislative common frameworks would be required? Yes, it, it does. I mean, taking aside the things that need no action, by definition, they should have no action. Though, as I say, the UK government reserves its position to change that definition at at its whim. So I'm, I'm not 100% not certain that that will be the case, but 99% sure that would be. So in the middle area, yes, that would be more discussion, but they're easier to resolve because we're not anticipating legislation is required. Thank you. Alex Riley. Okay. I think those of us who, or some of us, who don't see necessarily independence as the answer would, would still be arguing that if you're going to negotiate frameworks, then it's about the the states of Scotland, England, Ireland and, and Wales going to the table as equals. And if you can accept the principle that people start from being equals, then, then, then the dispute resolution mechanism is, is, is key to that, is it not? But can I ask in terms of the process for developing these frameworks, is there an opportunity there? How would the Scottish Government engage with key stakeholders? So if we take fisheries or farming, as, as, as examples of that, and do you prioritise uh, how, how what the, the process, the time scale? Would you prioritise that based on what? Yeah, I mean, on the, on the first point, I mean, I very much agree with you, and this is the basis of our your very close work with 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 the government of Wales, you know, which is not a nationalist government, uh, you know, and I work very closely with Mark Drakeford and continue to do so. But it's on the basis we have different endpoints in our objective. <coughs> But we accept, you know, at this stage in the journey, absolutely, the need for people to be treated with equity and the nations to be treated with equity and to behave in that way. And that's a, a simple principle. It, it's a pity it can't be accepted you know, by at least one of the four, because if it can be accepted, then everything else flows from it, and we don't find ourselves in these difficulties. In terms of stakeholders, it's very intensive engagement with stakeholders on a number of levels. The normal engagement of a cabinet secretary with, with his or her stakeholders carries on regardless. And of course, much of the topic of that would be, in this occasion, would be Brexit. I, I think um, uh, the cabinet secretary has held at least two very big events for stakeholders and many, many regular events for stakeholders. Uh, there's another level of engagement, which is I will meet with stakeholders either jointly with the Cabinet Secretaries or separately, um, and I continue to do that in, in a whole variety of ways. It's been somewhat um, interrupted in the last three or four weeks by other work here, but I have a very intensive diary of engagement and will continue to do so. For example, it recommences next week. I'm in Aberdeen next week uh, for, for a day, uh, and I will continue to talk to people. Prioritisation is a, is, a, is a difficult issue in this because everybody is worried about the timescale, and everybody is looking at this and saying, we need some action now. I mean, an example springs to mind in the pharmaceutical industry where the uncertainty about the medicines agency has created a circumstance in which companies have been expending very considerable sums of money, I mean in the millions, uh, ensuring that their products are re-registered and recertified in order to allow the present situation to continue. Now, 
the UK has said it wants to continue in membership of the Med Medicines Agency. That was part of the Mansion House speech. But there is no mechanism for that. There is no mechanism for having an additional country as a member. So that has to be negotiated. So they're saying we have a lead time for what we're doing. We passed the first uh, trigger for that last, uh, last autumn, essentially. So they had to start expending very considerable sums of money. Now they will be saying, and I need to re-engage with them as a light of the, the document yesterday and, the, and the, the possible transition period, they'll now be saying our time horizon has altered and we need these things to happen in order to know that this agency is in place uh, so that we don't have to expend even more money. So we have to recognise the dynamic within each sector and, and respond to that. We're going to see that become quite pressing this summer in both hospitality, I expect, and in agriculture and in horticulture, where there will be a further diminution, in my view, of the labour available, and people will then be saying, we need a new migration system put in place that guarantees that, um, and, our, and the time horizon for that was last year, because actually we're now seeing a diminution of that taking place, and there will be a further diminution uh, in 2019 and in 2020, as they anticipate what is taking place. Now, the migration white paper, which was due to appear before Christmas, and indeed I said to the then Migration Minister at a meeting, Brandon Lewis, would he guarantee it would be uh, published before Christmas or after Christmas? And he said he wouldn't say, but it would be sooner rather than later. They're now saying it will be the end of this year before it appears. Now, if it's the end of this year, we've missed this year. So we don't know what's going to take place. We do know, however, that EU citizens continue to come here until the end of 2020 uh, and qualify and be treated in the same way as other citizens. That was a concession from the UK uh, yesterday in the, in the transition document. But that pressure is going to mount. So when do we get those decisions? So part of our job in the Scottish Government and those discussions with the UK Government is to remind the UK Government constantly of what the priorities are in Scotland, what the sectoral priorities are and how they get dealt with. Financial services is another one, talking to somebody in financial services yesterday. They have a time horizon, and they're missing the time horizon at the moment. So timescales are, are very difficult in terms of being able to say what the time frame is for this. Is the Scottish Government satisfied that it is deploying enough resources, uh, given that there seems to be an uncertainty around timescale and uncertainty about what's going to be involved in this? So are you employing enough resources to this uh, and what are the implications for focusing so much on Brexit and other areas of policy and development? Yes, uh, and that is of course an issue. I don't think we are nearly as badly off in that regard as the UK government for whom Brexit is a black hole that is sucking in all endeavour and all activity. I mean, you, know, you can't have a conversation in Whitehall unless it's about Brexit. We're conscious of that. We've structured ourselves differently. You know, I operate in a different way from Dexu operates. I'm perhaps, if I may put it this way, though I don't necessarily feel it after the last month, more fleet of foot than, than, than Dexu is. Uh, I work closely with all the cabinet secretaries advising and supporting them. I direct, work directly to the first minister in that regard. I am not, I have never been constrained by resource in the sense that the, the things I ne think I need to be done are done. The UK government has allocated three billion pounds initially to the task of Brexit. It will cost a great deal more than that, in my opinion. And we are in negotiations about allocating some of that money so that Scotland has that money. We will have to spend what it takes to do this, regrettably. I think this is an enormous waste of money. There are other things we could do. But because we are operating differently, then I'm, I'm, I'm able, I hope, to support my colleagues in a way that allows them also to focus on the other things and, uh, and a legislative programme that has ambition and which is pursuing its way through the Parliament. Not on that point. Um, uh, yes, I, I will because um, this portfolio and uh, the rural economy portfolio are probably the two portfolios that have, are experiencing the biggest impact uh, of this work. Um, and there has been uh, some restructuring within uh, uh, um, Scottish Government in terms of managing this um, because we felt that was absolutely uh, necessary. Um, it is a major challenge um, and uh, um, Mike Russell has mentioned the UK's £1.3 billion spend in terms of the resource. What's worth uh, actually noting in that is that within that £1.3 at the UK level, DEFRA and Bayes 
have been allocated um, significantly higher funding than other departments um, because of the same portfolio impact that occurs uh, down there. Um, the, so far, the indications are that the Scottish Government is only going to get about £37.3 million, pounds, and obviously there will need to be a decision taken if that's what it becomes uh, as to how that's allocated uh, um, and whether or not they are, uh, those resources um, are sufficient. But it does mean that whether we like it or not, we have to try and approach this on a, on a sort of risk-based prioritisation um, in terms of areas to try and uh, keep delivering in terms of policy as well as managing this process. And it's a very complex pro process. And I, I have one example just to walk the committee through if they want to just hear it, the kind of thing that has to be gone through. Um, officials have given me uh, uh, just one example to show the scale of the task confronting us. Um, and that's just in identifying <coughs> potential legislative deficiencies. So, one item of legislation, the Pollution Prevention and Control Scotland Regulations 2012. Okay, now, I don't expect committee members to, 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 to be writing this down and kind of thinking about this because it's quite complex, but it's to understand the way the process has to work. Section 26A of those regulations states that SEPA must ensure that a permit contains such conditions as it considers necessary to give effect to the provisions of Schedule 1B to those regulations. So the terms of this section at 26A uh, would not appear to be affected by withdrawal, if you just read that as I've read it out. However, if you go to Schedule 1B, which is what's referred to, Three quarters of the way through that schedule, it states um, at uh, para 17B that existing medium combustion plants until 1st January 2030 are exempt from the air quality requirements uh, in, in other sections of the schedule where the plant is situated in a zone which conforms with limit value set out in Directive 2008 slash 50 slash EC. And at that point, you then have to go to the directive, which de defines the zones with reference to member states. So as a result, that exemption will no longer work post EU withdrawal, as medium combustion plants in the UK will no longer be in a member state, rendering the original provision deficient. So the definition in that shed, in that statutory instrument no longer works. That's just one section within one of hundreds of statutory instruments. And this is the kind of work that's having to go on as the weeks and months go by. And in terms of scale around deficiencies, I mean, how big an issue is this? Well, I mean, we literally have to go through all of these statutory instruments to establish that. Um, uh, um, I, I would imagine the scale is significant and certainly for across your portfolio and the sorry the Christmas scanning's portfolio and the, the rural economy portfolio we're talking four five six hundred instruments that need to be looked through and they can range from anything from a page or two to hundreds of pages um, and every time you're looking th we need to look through obviously the Scottish domestic legislation and then when you have to refer on to the directors and the regulations they can extend to hundreds of pages so we're talking and, and this is just the legislative aspects. This is not looking at day one readiness in terms of administration, policy, funding, okay. delivery on the ground. So what is the resource that's been directed to that? How far into the process are you? And when do we envisage this process being concluded, realistically? Well, I mean, we're in the process because I wouldn't have been able to give you that example. How if far, we, if how we far into it? Um, uh, how how in far case. in we're, we're not... Uh, anywhere uh, um, uh, uh, near finished, it will take a considerable amount of time. I may warn the committee it's probably going to take a considerable amount of committee time when we start to look at the resolution of this. Um, uh, and uh, there is a lot of uh, work um, currently happening. Um, 
we're actually in the process of identifying all possible deficiencies, but some of that does depend on what the, what the terms of the withdrawal agreement are. I mean, we, we, you know, we are seeing a kind of, at the moment, difficult to assess, and you've heard from Mike Russell about the uncertainties around that. Um, so the terms of any withdrawal agreement, we've only just as of, what, the last 48 hours, uh, heard what the transition period is going to, is going to be um, and what the terms of any future relationship with the UK EU are. If things do work out in terms of, you know, uh, pharmaceutical industry, then some of what's here may not have to be dealt with in early course. It might have to, you know, it might be able to be dealt with later. So at the moment, we are in a, f a world of uncertainty. Do you want to...? The legislation in front of the Parliament at the present moment uh, has categories of, of, of items that have to be repatriated. Uh, if you look at the secondary legislation, which is what uh, Rosanna Cunningham has been referring to there, um, it will all have to be looked at, and there are many thousands of items to be looked at. And it's not surprising. You know, we've been uh, you know, involved with Europe in this way for 46 years. There's bound to be a, a vast amount of material. The actual number that will contain deficiencies, that is things which will, would render the uh, instrument inoperable were they to continue is still a matter of speculation. But uh, my own estimate at the present moment is at least uh, doubling the amount of secondary legislation going through in the next couple of years. So you might go from 300 to 600 items and perhaps more. Uh, it will depend. Uh, we would, to be fair, and let's not just overstate this because it's sometimes possible just to go hold your hands up and say how horrific this is. Uh, most officials who work you know, in a particular area will know their area pretty well, will know where the, the European links are and the European issues are, and will pick those up. And people like Ian Jordan, who's wor who have worked in uh, Europe and have worked in Scotland, are familiar with these links as well. But it's a significant amount of work. We are into it, but there's a, a Scottish government-wide set of responsibilities. And then two points apply, which Rosanna Cunningham has raised, which are very important. We do not know uh, the detail of the arrangements for withdrawal, and that will affect it because some things may remain the same. So you don't want to have to change something and then change it back. You know, so that is really important. And, and the, sec the second one is the timescale of it. If we've got until the end of December 2020, which the, this document, and no, no European document is short, but that is the transition document. If this transition document is, is eventually what happens, then we've got that period of time. If it isn't, and you know, something goes badly wrong, say this autumn, then we won't have that time. Um, if, however, there is a longer period of transition, uh, you know, which is something that in, you will hear talked of quite a lot amongst the 27, uh, and you know, the not political noise around that is interesting this morning in terms of what might or might not happen, then you might have a longer period of time to do it. But we are focusing at the present moment on till December 2020, the job of work we've got to be done, the individual portfolios, as Susanna Cunningham has indicated, and uh, trying to make sure that we understand the context in which this is happening. Okay. Um, Donald Cameron, then Mark Roscoe. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning. Um, in terms of resources, I, I have no doubt this will cause um, extra work for a lot of people. Do you think this gives you good grounds within the Scottish Government's budget for asking for a greater slice of the pie? I think if you ask any uh, cabinet secretary about their portfolio, they will always be able to come up with arguments to uh, ask for a greater slice of the pie. But I need to just remind everybody that we did get, uh, we did do better in, in uh, budget this year than, than other portfolios uh, already. And some of that is a reflection of the, of the importance of a number of the, um, uh, number of the key portfolio areas. Um, the Scottish pie, we can argue about, because I don't think the Scottish pie is is anywhere near large enough for us to be able to have uh, within any portfolio um, the resources that we would all want, and I think that's a that's a kind of truth which is self-evident. We will always be um, uh, um, we will always be looking for more. Um, in terms of the argument about the share of the Scottish. Uh, Barnet consequentials, if one likes. I mean, the UK is spending £1.3 billion, but their intention is to, at this point, give us 2.5% of that, £37.3 
Um, uh, uh, yes, I will argue very strongly uh, um, internally for uh, uh, that there are two portfolios that probably need uh, assistance more than others, but come on, 2.5% of what the UK government thinks is appropriate to spend on this, um, and uh, uh, you can see the inequity there before we even begin. Uh, it is way above my pay grade to decide in any way what people should get out of the Scottish pie, but I am of absolutely no doubt that the pie that should be sliced in a way to pay for this is the United Kingdom pie, because it is the United Kingdom that is dragging Scotland out of the EU, and therefore the cost of this exercise should be paid by the UK government. Mark Roscoe. Can I just go back to uh, common frameworks? And Minister, you, you talked about the fisheries, uh, you know, existing arrangements that we have, the kind of common framework that we have up to, up to a point. Um, I mean, presumably we could be heading towards a bilateral between the UK and the EU over fisheries next year uh, in advance of, you know, quota setting in late 2019. So has there been any progress in terms of a shared analysis between Scotland and the rest of the UK over the principles that sit behind the CFP. Because on the face of it, you, you perhaps share some criticisms of the CFP and perhaps share some uh, desire for reform, and, and indeed that's part of the, the arguments that were made in relation to Brexit. But I'm just wondering what, what the discussions are like under that particular shared framework and whether you, whether you have agreement on areas which you like and areas that you dislike in relation to the CFP. Well, I think none of us have made the secret of the fact that the CFP, the CFP has not been fit for a purpose for many of Scotland's fishing communities. But I think that's a question, to be fair, better addressed to, to, to Fergus Ewing than to me. The detail of this policy is for Fergus Ewing to take forward. Um, you know, I, I would just say that the transition agreement indicates it is not 2019 in which there will be a discussion about quota, but 2020 that there will be a discussion about quota. 2019 gives the uh, a, a right of consultation, but doesn't give any right of decision making. So any changes are not going to be kicking in until 2020, despite all the assurances that have come from certain political figures um, claiming that uh, you know, we'd be leaving the CFP in uh, March 2019. That was not true. It uh, was always not going to be true. Uh, and indeed, people who asserted that it was going to be true were guilty of a cruel deception. But uh, a, I, you know, I don't think supporting CFP is not something I would do. Um, there need to be changes. But that's something that Fergus is doing. And I'm sure if the member were to ask him or to, uh, to write to him, and I'm sure he'll take note that you've, you've asked me that question. Presumably there are areas which also cross over into environment as well, because the CFP deals with you know, the ecology of our uh, marine environment, and fisheries is one of the pressures within that. So. Well, yes, and the marine environment is one of the areas where there is still um, uh, discussion ongoing about uh, what a post-Brexit scenario would look like. Um, but it's uh, not, uh, as far as I'm aware, taking place within the context of a discussion about the CFP per se. And I, th I think people need to understand that when we're talking about these deep dives, these are all done at official level. So ministers are not directly involved at this stage. So in a sense, it's discussions between officials to try and hammer out uh, um, what is and is not in scope. But it's all done uh, caveated by uh, the understanding that those conversations don't have ministerial endorsement and anything that emanates from them would need to go back up or go to ministers for, uh, for discussion and endorsement mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. okay. it, it is, can I just say that the, the interpretation of the fishing section of the um, transition agreement is, is now becoming even clearer. And it is now clear that the, what it says is that although uh, at the quota talks in 2019 there will be the UK will be allowed to join the delegation. It won't be allowed in the same room. It won't be part of the negotiations. Um, and it won't be in head of delegations meetings. So in actual fact, this is very much a much, much, much worse deal than even the present deal. John McAlpine. Yes, in terms of environmental policy, um, Friends of the Air Scotland um, some time ago had raised issues about the loss of control um, in areas like renewable energy, climate change, air quality and fracking. And Nourish has said that um, 
taking uh, taking food standards away from um, Scotland could result in the diminution of the quality of food that we eat. That was, I raised those um, issues in Parliament with the Cabinet Secretary. It must be a good few months ago now. I just wondered, um, we're further down the line now. Are, are those organisations, can they take any comfort that we've moved any closer to resolving those issues? I don't believe any of our external stakeholders at the moment feel that there is a, a resolution in, in, in sight. There, there, there is a, a, um, a, a better conversation now taking place about broader environment principles. Uh, you know, um, we, we did finally get it on to the devolved administrations meeting in December last year, um, when we be that was our first substantive conversation around the broader environmental side. But um, in terms of discussing the kinds of things that you're talking about, more granular discussions uh, in terms of impact of the environment, they're not taking place at that level. They're taking place still at the official to official level while they try to bottom out what is and is not going to have an impact. I would, I would, I, I don't want to put words into organisations' mouths, but I haven't heard any organisations saying that they feel that the things are actually beginning to go in the right direction in terms of uh, what they might want to see. And there is still a considerable anxiety about certain aspects of the kinds of lists that um, Mike Russell uh, has read out. Um, climate change continues to be a concern. Um, GM foods continue to be a, a concern. There's a whole range of things which, uh, as yet, there is no resolution on. Um, and I'm not sure that I have heard any one of our partner organisations feeling that, that that had come any closer. OK. John Scott. Um, thank you. Uh, convener, I'm declaring an interest as a farmer. Um, what is clear is that it is unclear, I suppose. Um, but for in as much as you are able, uh, what progress is being made with respect to new post-Brexit funding frameworks, such as environmental funding frameworks, to replace CAP, structural funds, and funding for research and development? Um, well, uh, I mean, obviously there are uh, continued uh, conversations. Uh, I, to my knowledge, there is nothing that has been um, decided in any definitive way. Um, obviously, we have to continue to work with the UK government, and that's at every level um, in respect of uh, future funding arrangements. Um, these are vitally uh, important. But there is a lot of concern uh, about the fact that as yet, we don't have any details of successor arrangements uh, in, terms of, uh, uh, in terms of a post-Brexit scenario. Um, and while we continue to press the UK government on this, what, what we need is for devolved administrations to be actually engaged in the decision-making process around uh, uh, future uh, funding arrangements rather than being regarded as consultees, and of course we've just heard that the UK is going to be put into the position of being a consultee in terms of fishing, and you can hear how uh, unsatisfactory that will be considered to be, um, well, that is you know, the danger of where we are with uh, a lot of these things. Um, research and development continues to be a very significant concern in terms of future funding. Uh, we still have no resolution to that. Um, we continue to press the issue, but as yet there is no detailed discussion about what we are looking at, what potentially we will, we will have um, post-Brexit. And outside that, it makes it extremely difficult for us, and it goes back to some of the conversation we have earlier. You know, we, we can spend a lot of time and effort planning for a scenario that then turns out not to be the one that is decided upon, in which case, not only do we have to then go through that process again for a new scenario, it means we've wasted time planning for a scenario which didn't eventuate. There needs to be an understanding <coughs> in the UK government of the way in which Scotland accesses funds and why those funds are important. 
Uh, and there needs to arise out of that an agreement on a clear rules-based system that advantages those areas that need those funds most. Uh, that's where we should start. Um, now, we, we see, for example, with cap payments, that those are going to roll forward to 2020. Uh, Mr. Gove made a commitment to 2024. I don't know whether that is stuck or whether there's any Treasury backing for that, but uh, it's only to 2020. Um, and the, he's then talked about ways in which agricultural support will operate thereafter. That is a matter for Scotland to decide in terms of, of Scottish priorities. And that is the work, of course, that the agricultural champions have been doing and a variety of people people have been looking to look at the right thing there. But if you look at pillar two of CAP, and you look at rural support, um, and then you look at things like the social fund uh, and regional funding, those need to translate into funding packages and sources that are rules-based, that are transparent, and which reflect <coughs> what the needs of the respective parts are. That's why the European packages, with all their failings in terms of you know, over-bureaucracy sometimes, have been successful because they've recognized where need is, and then we have been able to access them in a way that actually suited us and worked for us. And that's what needs to take place. So far, that discussion isn't taking place. Uh, and indeed, I've not even had the opportunity to have that discussion, for example, through the JMC process. But we would be very, very keen to make it clear that that's what we need to have work for us, rather than some, the idea that there be some grand scheme devised in London, and then we'll simply be told to get on with it. Uh, and so, uh, and given that Mr Gove has indeed suggested that Scotland might wish to get on with devising its own scheme in this regard, and the rural champions are, have done some work on that and others, I dare say, um, do you have any timescales for when the Scottish Government may come forward with an idea um, as to how we might wish to create a successor organisation to CAP? Oh. Now, well, we're, we're certainly working on that process at the moment and we're just awaiting the final report from the Agricultural Champions which should be available in the next few months before looking at how we, how we take that forward in terms of our response and planning. Um, there, are, there are three separate aspects obviously that we need to plan for which is what would happen during a transition period depending on what that transition is while we're within the EU. Um, then for agricultural policy looking at what will essentially be transition to. So it will be a transition between the transition period with the EU and the transition period and getting a, a fully fledged replacement in place in Scotland. And then obviously what that fully fledged replacement for, for the cap will, will look like. So there's a number of scenarios and steps that we're looking through, relying heavily obviously on the work that the Agricultural Champions and Professor Griggs Greening Group and what's coming out of the NCRA in terms of the kind of impacts on the rural economy. I think it was interesting the recent uh, debate about this in the Scottish Farmer, if I, I recall, that you know the, the champions are seen to be and are saying, you know, that they're very much at one with the process that's taking place here. Uh, Richard Lyle and then Alex Rowley. Uh, Cabinet Secretaries, uh, good morning. You have uh, basically answered uh, the question I was going to ask, but I, I want to restate it. So, if you don't know what someone's doing or planning, how can you plan to be with them? Um, you don't know how much money you're going to get or how, how much money you're going to spend. And it annoys me intensely that people keep saying elsewhere within this building that you should be planning it, you should be making up your own rules. But I think uh, the Cabinet Secretary, um, Rosanna Cunningham, you answered the, the, the question. You don't know the rules, you don't know what's going to happen. So, and if you did plan something you'd, and they changed the rules, you'd have to replan it again. Am I correct in saying yeah, that? Yeah, I, I, I think we are in a, a, a sea of uncertainty at the moment. And if I can paraphrase an American politician, I think it was, who ended up you know, talking about the, the known unknowns. And at the moment, what we fear as well are the unknown unknowns. And that is the, that is the climate within which we are having to try and, and plan forward. So we can we can only do the best we can um, in terms of making a broad assessment of what the period between now and March 2019 will be like, between 2019 and the end of 2020, and then there's the post-2020 scenario. So that's the basically the, the, the three phases that we're really talking about. So you've, you, you're, you're trying to guesstimate in advance where you will be in each of those, of those particular periods of time. Now, that's not easy. 
um, uh, because if you get it wrong and you start designing uh, uh, schemes and policies on, the, on, one, on one basis and one assumption and then it turns out not to be true or gets whipped out from underneath your feet during a process of negotiation where things start getting traded backwards and forwards, then you're back to square one on a very shortened timescale of trying to scramble to put things in place that you hadn't foreseen 18 months previously. I mean, it, 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 it is the most unsatisfactory so, process. So basically, and to use a, a, a something that someone said before, you don't necessarily need to have a plan A, B, C, D, E, F. You need to have a plan A through Z. <laughs> which would self-evidently be impossible. So we have to try and assess the most likely outcomes and think about planning for the most likely outcomes. But that does create internal pressures as well, which okay. impact right across the board. We will match, the, we will rise to the challenge, whatever the challenge is. The challenge changes on a daily basis. Uh, it is the most uncertain set of circumstances I've ever seen. It is the most chaotic set of circumstances I've ever seen. And we have a, a UK government whose negotiating style appears to be to start off with the EU by refusing to accept any of the things that are put to it, to go through the whole process, and at the very end then to accept everything, but to claim this as a triumph because you can move to the next stage. Now, the problem with that is you've got to come to the end at some stage. You can't do that on every stage. They did it on the exit negotiations. Absolutely, you know, they were going to have their way. David Davis said he was this was going to be the toughest negotiations ever. They got to the end of that, and then they capitulated on everything. But they capitulated and said, look, we can get to the next stage. So now we've had the withdrawal discussions, and we've got up to the last minute, and they've suddenly said, look, oh, right, we give way on everything, but we'll get to the next stage. Now, the trouble is there's only a limited number of stages. And at the end of this process, they're going to have to agree to something. Uh, now, our, we have to be able to judge what the likelihood is of those agreements on certain issues and act accordingly. And therefore, you know, we spend time looking at that and thinking about that. But we also have to be a very cool and clear eye on what we actually see taking place in front of us and the way in which things are being done. And they're being done badly. Al Crowley. You say that, that, that if, if we only got an agreement on the question of the border, others may flow. But my question is more on influence, because listening to, to yourselves with the greatest respect, it, it just comes across that we really are not influencing very much in terms of these negotiations. And I was going to say, Michael Gove, for example, has made quite a number of high-key speeches uh, on, on the, the CARP and his vision going forward. Uh, although I did note last week, the week before, that Ruth Davison and Michael Gove made an intervention on fisheries, uh, and that doesn't seem to have influenced much. But the question is, the question is, are you, are you having discussions at ministerial level with UK ministers, and is there any way trying to influence from, from that angle? Does anybody have any influence, or, or is it just not the case? I, I, you know, I can only speak from my experience in, in respect of this, and um, the fact is that we have had um, a, a fair number of meetings at ministerial level uh, involving DEFRA, my counterpart in Wales, um, and officials from Northern Ireland. Um, and I think the engagement, the devolved administration's meetings that are conducted within the DEFRA portfolio areas, and that's both... Fergus Ewing and myself, are probably the most extensive in policy terms of any, uh, uh, any portfolios that, that, that we could have. So, and I've always said that. So, so in that sense, the, the, the DEFRA ministers have been ahead of the game in terms of, of that sort of relationship. Um, but, you know, while there have been a significant number of meetings at the, 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 the ministerial level, so one, two, three, four, Six. There have been seven ministerial level meetings um, so far, and there's another one uh, um, on Monday uh, in London that I'll, I'll be going to. Um, the, the extent to which uh, uh, the sense from them that I would take away that there is a great deal of, of effective outcome is... I would say there would have to be a question mark over that. There are, you know, there's a lot of discussion, but I'm not entirely convinced that we're 
getting, <laughs> we're actually having it at the level that needs to be had in order to move things forward. And you put your finger on a, a kind of slightly separate issue, which is you are aware you are speaking to ministerial counterparts who themselves can be overruled, themselves have their own arguments within their own governments, themselves have their own finance ministers to have to deal with. Um, and it is, you know, so, so that you are conscious that at that, even at the level, at the ministerial level, there are still layers of this conversation uh, going on elsewhere that may impact back on the conversations that you're having. And it was, I have to say, it was a, a, it, no secret that, you know, I, I, there was a level of frustration that I was feeling that it wasn't until the meeting in December uh, that I managed to get environment, environmental issues onto the agenda and, dis and, and, and discussed. They had been on the agenda um, at a meeting in February, but um, nobody else came prepared to discuss the environment, so it kind of fell off the agenda. And it wasn't until December, just gone, that we managed to get environment onto. And that is a kind of a sense in which you, you the ministerial level meetings, I, I'm, I'm, we engage because we must engage, clearly, and sometimes <coughs> some helpful things come out of it, but I'm conscious all the time, for precisely the reason you put your finger on, that you're also discussing these things with people who may themselves Absolutely. be left high and dry yeah. <laughs> by decisions taken in another place, and, 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 and that's what we're always subject to. A question, if I may, can I just move this on a little bit, Mr. Mr. Russell? John Scott has a question, I think, directly for you on a subject that, that you have pressed the UK government on. John Scott. Um, yes, moving from the, the general to the particular in terms of the immediacy of a need for a seasonal worker scheme, I've raised this in questions in Parliament, and also I wonder if you have raised this with, in your discussions with UK government ministers because it affects us all equally across the United Kingdom, the need for such a scheme, and if you have a, an update on the likelihood of that. I've raised it on a number of occasions, so has Fergus Ewing raised it. We have raised the need for continued um, freedom of movement, which is the best solution to this. I have to say I am none the wiser. The, I explained about the issue of the uh, white paper on migration, which requires to consider this. I know that the fruit growers, for example, have met with the UK government on a couple of occasions and come away tearing their hair out at the lack of progress that, with, that is taking place. There is, a, there is a huge reluctance to address these issues. And the point that Rosanna Cunningham <coughs> makes is an important point. It may not be the ministers themselves. The ministers themselves may believe it needs to be addressed. But uh, there, is, there is no plan, there is no uh, master plan of how you get from A to B on this. This is a, a voyage in which the UK government engaged on of, of, of trying to avoid going on the rocks created by the extreme Brexiteers and going on the rocks created by the EU. And they're trying to steer their way through that and there's no plan to do so. So I'm afraid, you know, no matter what we say on this, then we're not getting the result we want. But can I, can I please address Slightly more widely. If, if, if I may, before you move on, Mr. Russell, please. Um, so, seeking to reassure the industry, then, does, the, does this continuity document as produced yesterday, uh, uh, does the document that was produced yesterday. The transition does, document. The transition, forgive me. Does that um, offer a freedom of movement until 2020? It does. Did I it and does. therefore, does that mean that there isn't such a pressing need for a seasonal worker scheme this no, year? No, it, it doesn't and mean that, regrettably, because we're seeing a, an attrition on people coming year on year. The convener represents the prime fruit growing area of Scotland. You know, the number of people who are prepared to come are, uh, is diminishing. The number of people who stay year to year is diminishing. People don't want to come because they don't feel welcome. That's the effect of the United Kingdom government on this thing. They don't feel welcome. They don't feel secure. It's also so the effect of, which of a weaker currency. But, uh, but can, I, can I just widen it very slightly? There's two ways you can influence things. You can stop bad things happening and you can make good things happen. And I think Mr. Rowley and I probably long for the days when we were working, him as General Secretary of the Labour Party and me as Chief Executive of the SNP, to, to help to make this parliament happen. And that seemed to be clear. And we thought we were making good things happening from different standpoints. On the continuity bill, we're trying to stop the wrong things happening because those things undermine this parliament. 
But it, making the good things happen, really, we define at the present moment as saying, let's try and ensure that the, the worst that happens is continued membership of the single market and the customs union. And I have to say, I, I'm very much with my, my colleague Mark Drakeford on this, who, who frequently says that if you look at that argument over the last 18 months, it has been flowing towards us. You know, in terms of the customs union, a much stronger recognition now that that's essential. A recognition that the single market and the customs union would be the way to solve the Northern Irish situation. And a wider recognition in this parliament and across Scotland and across lots of the UK that leaving the single market would be a disastrously foolish thing to do. So that there is a continuing progress, in my view, on this issue against a backdrop of absolute chaos where you know, ministers themselves often don't know what is taking place, UK ministers, where decisions are centralised and decisions are taken because of this, try, trying to find a, a middle way between extreme forces. So you know, we, I think we are making some progress, but I can't honestly say it's the happiest thing I've ever done, and you wake up every morning wondering you know, what is next. But the certainties that we're looking for are not there, and it is extraordinary that a, a task of this complexity and difficulty, and in my view foolishness, is being undertaken in this way. I mean, that is an absolute dereliction of duty. Very briefly on, on this point that we're on, uh, John McAlpine. Well, my point was actually on the environment, actually. Yeah, <laughs> to get back to environmental matters. Um, notwithstanding the difficulties that you've outlined, um, you know, can I welcome some of the planning measures you've taken, like the round table on the environment and climate change that you've set up. Um, I wonder if you were able to just briefly update the committee on, uh, on its work and any, any, any issues that it's identified uh, going forward, such as gaps in monitoring and enforcement? Uh, well, as it happens, uh, having asked the roundtable for advice on uh, environmental kind of governance gaps, um, I received it at about 8 p.m. last night, and uh, I think other than to basically say that they've obviously completed that stage of their work, I now have to look at it in some detail. And I wouldn't want to try and embark on a discussion about it um, uh, uh, at this point until I've had an opportunity to talk it through with officials. Um, uh, but, but yes, there is, uh, uh, there is work being done in respect of uh, uh, what we would identify as governance gaps in Scotland. Um, and that's uh, a, a piece of work that will probably take up a considerable amount of time now once we've got that, uh, uh, once we've had a look at that. But uh, um, I think that um, uh, I think that given how late in the day it came um, in terms of, and to be fair to the round table, that was the deadline they were given. They weren't to know that I would be sitting here the next morning. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, so I think that that might be uh, a, a discussion better had at the next time I'm in front of the committee, which, uh, to my recollection, is not that far away. Correct. Okay. Um, but I think some colleagues want to explore this a little bit further. Mark Roscoe. Yes, thanks, convener. I appreciate it. It was only concluded at 8pm last night. But can you just talk a bit, Cabinet Secretary, about what the process is now? What further work will the roundtable be doing? Uh, will this document, this initial document, be published? Um, how do you expect Parliament to, to engage in that? What opportunities will there be? I'm obviously aware that you'll be coming back to committee, but I, I think for us to be able to really look at this work, look at the options that are being proposed. I've seen that there are various options that are being proposed. Yeah, I mean... We're a little uh, bit in the dark here. Yeah, the, the, I mean, they have literally only just completed their work, um, and... Uh, still finalising their report, but um, what they've given me is initial views, really, um, and uh, they do, uh, they are, as far as I'm aware, going to flag up a number of areas where they think we need to do further research and consideration. So uh, what was received uh, last night, I don't think is, is not an end point uh, to this process. Um, and uh, obviously I'll need to consider the options and decide uh, 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 on which ones I want the round table to go back to and look at with, uh, uh, with a good bit more detail. Um, once they've provided the final report and, uh, and we have a much clearer sense of the identification of the governance gaps um, and the options that exist to, to, to deal with those, then, uh, uh, then obviously that conclusion has to be looked at um, and I know that there is a discussion taking place in the context of the continuity bill um, about 
about a, a wider consultation uh, in respect uh, of that, which I would um, uh, would anticipate at that point, uh, the whole environmental governance issue will be a much wider question um, uh, out there more openly. It's fair to say that um, uh, I, I referred to the December meeting and uh, the, the Jeffra DA meeting in December was when the um, uh, the um, uh, the environmental issues were first really actively on the agenda. Uh, there was some brief discussion about environmental governance at that point and an indication that the UK government was going to consult in respect of England uh, in terms of what they were proposing. Um, that hasn't yet happened, so I'm, I'm not... I don't have any sense in which I know what they're intending to do either. Um, and we're back to, I suppose we're circling back around to the issue of frameworks, if you like, because uh, uh, there are a lot of different ways to deal with this issue. Um, mm -hmm. But if we talk about it in a UK sense, then from our perspective, we would want it to look more like the kind of Council of Ministers that, or... or something set up along that basis than I suspect will come from the UK government. Mm -hmm. So there, you know, there's going to be that debate going on and then there's the, the, the one that will take place in respect of the round table advice um, and that uh, I think is obviously going to be a live discussion throughout spring mm -hmm. and summer. Can I ask, did the December meeting discuss what happens when we lose the European Court of Justice? And is that a, a work stream that the round table is Well, that's, the, that's, the, that's, the, the, that's the, the governor's issue, is, yeah. is what takes its place. How, how do we replace that? Um, uh, and the UK government um, had an initial proposal which didn't sound, certainly to, either to myself or to the Welsh, as being a, a, a route that we would necessarily want to follow. Um, as I've indicated, they haven't yet published a consultation on it yet. Mm. So whether or not that initial proposal is what actually mm. comes out in their consultation, I don't know. Um, uh, but we need to, we do need to look at how we might think about managing that in mm -hmm. Scotland. Um, and there may be issues for the whole of the UK, but then, as I said, we're back to the framework conversation mm -hmm. again mm -hmm. as to how that's managed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just in terms of the conclusions that were drawn around environmental courts last year in, in Scotland, I mean, obviously there are many definitions of what an environmental court may or may not be, but has the government effectively now drawn a line under that issue, or is, is that still is there still some flavour of environmental court that you're that you're considering? Well, I don't want to be drawn into a conversation about what I'm actually considering at the moment because I really need time to look at what the round table has identified thus right, far okay. as gaps. Um, uh, it, it, it will really, you know, we, you, you want to work up from that basis rather than starting at the top and working down. So okay. let's, let's identify what the, what the governance gaps are in practice and then decide, given the nature of those <laughs> gaps, what is the most appropriate way to manage their, their handling mm -hmm. in a post-Brexit scenario. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Finlay Carson. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, the limited extent to parliamentarians have any control over e the EU and legislative at the moment, um, what role do you see the Scottish Parliament have in scrutinising common frameworks once they're proposed and how will they operate once they're in place? Uh, <laughs> I mean, that, 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 I, I mean, at the moment, we have to decide the basis on which the frameworks are being set up. These deep dives aren't about discussing frameworks, they're about deciding whether or not a framework is actually necessary. Um, if we decide uh, uh, that a framework is absolutely necessary, it's uh, GMC that is deciding the, the, the principles behind how those frameworks should work, and at the moment they're not, that discussion, discussion has not come to a conclusion. No, uh, I, I think you can take it that the discussion from the Scottish Government's point of view has been to ensure that every way is found to ensure that the Scottish Parliament can scrutinise. And I would think that the, uh, the earnest of good faith in this is the um, Continuity Bill, which has a higher level of scrutiny than the EU Withdrawal Bill, considerably higher. And moreover, that uh, during it, the, its passage at uh, 
at stage two, uh, uh, sessions of which you were uh, present at, then I uh, accepted changes that would <coughs> increase that scrutiny even further. So the role that the Parliament plays in scrutiny has been emphasised by ourselves. Uh, and, and indeed, uh, for example, some of the proposals I've been floating about in terms of how uh, agreement would become to would involve the Parliament agreeing as opposed to Scottish ministers agreeing. Um, I, I don't necessarily buy into the view that there isn't scrutiny of EU legislation. There is scrutiny of EU legislation. The scrutiny of EU legislation and regulation through this Parliament, through the Westminster Parliament and through the European Parliament. So uh, there's a triple scrutiny, you might say. But um, I've championed, as the Scottish Government has championed, uh, an increased level of scrutiny and an increased involvement by the Parliament, and we'll continue to do so. OK, so uh, do you foresee <laughs> new government-to-government -government, uh, processes put in place to, to deal with common frameworks now and, and going forward, then? Well, that, that's the idea. I mean, th that's the idea. I mean, as I indicated, the, the list of three categories it indicates how those would operate. I suppose indicates what the government to government, parliament to parliament relationship would be, uh, and both of those things. In the first category, there's no need for any change. That's, that's just going to go on. Those subjects shouldn't have been in the list. In the second list, there are existing arrangements which are non-legislative, uh, non which can either continue or be enhanced. And again, there would be a role for parliament both in scrutiny and in decision making. In the third area, uh, where legislation may be required, then is that there's a, there are layers of scrutiny and decision making. And of course, if the Sewell process is, applies to all those areas, if there is legislation, something which, you know, uh, unfortunately in this Parliament, the Scottish Conservatives have not confirmed, although I was interested to see Lord Keane confirm it in the House of Lords, which I think is a helpful step, and I hope he continues to do so, then there would also be the scrutiny of the legislative consent process. So in those circumstances, and the, and the, the involvement of Parliament in the legislative consent process. So I see that continuing. But those frameworks need to operate on the basis, as uh, Mr. Raleigh has indicated earlier, uh, of equality, of the partners uh, working together and being treated equally and treating each other equally. Otherwise, they can't work. Okay. okay. Uh, Kate Forbes, do you want to come in on that? No. Um, probably not. I was okay. going to ask, uh, because the original point was asked by Don Cameron if there was any supplementaries. Then. Um, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning to you both and to the officials. Uh, you have um, already touched on it, um, uh, Cabinet Secretary uh, Russell. Could I ask you, though, to give us any further comments on the update um, uh, since last week on environmental principles and the continuity bill? I think that would be helpful. And also from uh, yourself, Cabinet Secretary Cunningham. And you, you did say that... Um, it was only in December, as we all already knew, that the environmental issues were being seriously taken seriously, as I understand it, um, uh, by the Westminster Tory government. And uh, also, um, Mike Russell, you did, I quote from earlier this morning, say there was no master plan. So if clause, uh, which I would heartily agree with uh, from my reading of it, if... if um, Clause 11 was to uh, proceed, um, and there wasn't the necessity, possibly, or for um, our continuity bill, which I, of course, very much hope and feel confident will pass tomorrow, then, then what opportunities are there for environmental protection within that, and how can we influence it? Um, if, you, if you want to deal with the continuity bill, as you are aware, uh, so we are having a conversation here on the basis that we both yes. know what's happened, but it's yes. useful to put it on the record. Yes. As, you, as you're aware, the uh, helpful uh, and useful amendments that you, <coughs> Colin Smythe, um, um, a, a Mr. Ruskell and uh, Tavish Scott moved on environmental issues and on animal sentience issues uh, were the subject of further discussion, as yes. I offered. Uh, we have reached an agreement on what those amendments should be. Those amendments have now been tabled, and I look forward to you proposing them and me accepting them tomorrow. Uh, and hopefully that will contribute to the progress of the bill. And I think I saw Mr. Ruskell tweeting on, on, on Friday night, this was mature politics. I think it's a good phrase. I mean, that has been a useful Sorry, exchange of working together to allow <laughs> things to actually happen. And I, and I think that that's very helpful. And we've, I hope we've managed to do it in some other areas as well. Um, in terms of Clause 11, I mean, I think the point you make is an entirely fair point. Um, if there's, Clause 11 was to remain unchanged, 
Um, and if there was to be no element of agreement or consent, both between governments and between parliaments in, in Mr. Carson's term, then anything is possible. You know, given that there is you know, complete clarity from the UK government that the existing list, whilst they say they won't alter, they could alter, and they want to construct a system based on the exception rather than the rule, and that's, that's a rather interesting way in which things are now done uh, by the UK government. Any system has to encompass any and all eventualities to stop things happening, rather than saying, here's how we're going to do things, and if there are exemptions, uh, uh, exceptions, we'll try and, and, and deal with those then you know, it is perfectly possible that they could drag in you know, something from the first list or they could find something new that they hadn't thought of that comes into the list. And, and we would be powerless to stop it. And that's why the issue of agreement or consent is at the heart of this. Because if agreement and consent is there, then it is perfectly possible for them to come and to say, we have suddenly discovered in the, in the depths of this legislation something that we need to put on this list. Let's agree to do so. And we say that's a reasonable case that you've put. We're not going to unreasonably withhold that consent. Let's do it. But to be put in the position to say, it doesn't really matter what you think because we're going to do this, anything could happen. Okay. Mark Roscoe. Yes, can I, can I thank you for you know, reflecting on, on the progress that we've made there. Um, the, I was particularly pleased to see the, the commitments around Article 13, the Lisbon Treaty, um, animal sentience, um, finding a place, an appropriate place um, within the bill. But in terms of taking principles around animal sentience further forward, I think everybody you know, recognises there's still work to do on that. And I'm aware, Cabinet Secretary, that you know, there have been discussions between yourself and the UK government around the animal sentencing bill, uh, which is currently uh, going through Westminster and, and has been you know, stalled to an extent, there has been extensive debate around how to put a new improved uh, definition around animal sentience into that bill. Do you, I mean, how confident are you that, that, that that's the most appropriate vehicle to take the debate forward? Because we've effectively saved animal sentience, or we will hopefully tomorrow effectively save animal sentience in the continuity bill, but there is still a, a debate about where do we go next? And I, I want to ask you what your reflections are on, on the discussions with Westminster ministers and whether you know, you have faith that um, that, that process around the UK uh, bill is, is adequate to, to reflect uh, our own concerns? Well, I, I suppose the, the, the general response to that would be because there is a bill going through the UK um, Parliament, it was sensible to have a conversation at that point with regard to that. If it doesn't work out, then we're back to having to look at why we best manage it here uh, in Scotland. So I think it's really just... Uh, you know, trying to work with uh, what looks like uh, um, the currently best available option to do it. If not, then we're back to thinking about how we manage it in Scotland. Now, you know, you've, you've heard me say that actually I think we've already got the, 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 the things in place in Scotland and if people want a different formulation, then we need to find a way to legislate uh, for that slightly different formulation. Um, uh, but let's see if we can make it work through the, through the UK bill. Um, uh, first, I mean, you know, it's 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 trying a mechanism, and then if that doesn't work, we'll fall back into mm. a, into a different conversation. Uh, are, you, are you happy with the current definition that's being put forward into the UK bill? Does that, does that satisfy you, or, or do you share some of the concerns of the EFRA committee around that? I think um, officials are currently in discussions with EFRA officials on how that is going to be taken forward, and obviously. Different officials themselves are currently working on a number of the comments that were that were made. So, I think, as Ms. Cunningham said, this is part of the ongoing discussion about whether this is the most appropriate vehicle. And the hope is that it is. And if it is not, and if it does not meet all the relevant concerns, then alternatives can be considered. So that's 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 an ongoing conversation that's happening at the moment. Okay. 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 Uh, can I thank you very much for your evidence this morning? Um, I think that was useful. And uh, I'm going to suspend for five minutes till we change the panel.
The uh, third item on the agenda is to take evidence on the Conservation of Salmon Scotland Amendment Regulations 2018 SSI 2018 forward slash 37 from the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, Rosanna Cunningham, and uh, her officials uh, who have been involved in its construction, namely Dr John Armstrong, and uh, Simon Dryden, who gave evidence to the committee last week. Uh, in addition, I, I welcome Jackie Bailey, MSP, and Liz Smith, MSP, who have joined the committee for this item. I invite each of them in turn to declare any interest they may have in relation to the instrument. Firstly, Jackie Bailey. Um, none, convener. And Liz Smith. Uh, nothing that's registrable. Okay, thank you very much. So we will move to uh, any questions that members uh, have on uh, this issue. Sorry, Cabinet Secretary. You get to say something. Well, if, you, if, you, if you wish to say a few words. Thanks. I think it would be helpful um, just to remind um, people of the background to this, um, because these regulations, the first of these regulations was introduced in 2016 um, against a background of threatened infraction proceedings from the European Commission and more general concerns about the downward trend in salmon stocks in our rivers. And the issue about numbers of wild salmon in our rivers continues to be uh, um, a, a concern the regulations were introduced alongside other conservation measures after a lot of discussion with a wide range of stakeholders. Now, the impact of those regulations wasn't universally popular then, and I'm aware that it's not universally popular now, but as Richard Lockhead, who uh, introduced them uh, first, um, stated to the then Rural Affairs Committee, not just uh, that we need to manage the exploitation of salmon not just because it's a protected species under the Habitats Directive, but because it is the right thing to do. Salmon is synonymous with Scotland. But it's a good reminder that it is a protected species under the Habitats Directive. The regulations being considered today are the third set of measures being brought forward, this time for the 2018 fishing season, and they do reflect on a great deal of work uh, in consultation with stakeholders around the country, and that's work to develop and improve the scientific model and the quality of data used in that model. And they also reflect the fact that the numbers of salmon returning to our rivers to spawn is still showing a downward trend year on year. The percentage of returning adults has reduced from around 25% to 5%. And while there's a clear need for additional research into the various and complex range of factors involved in this, we've got to take decisive action. I believe, therefore, it is imperative that we take a precautionary approach to determining whether and where stocks can be exploited. If we don't follow such an approach, there's a real danger that, yet again, we will face infraction proceedings because we are failing to protect and to demonstrate that we are protecting our special areas of conservation. Doing nothing is not an option. We're never going to have a perfect model because scientific modelling doesn't work that way. There will always be uncertainties, and what we try to do is to minimise the uncertainties improve the assessment process year on year where possible and ensure that we're taking a sensible approach to protecting our salmon stocks for future generations of anglers. And I'm confident that we are using the best available data and scientific advice. And for the 2018 season, we have assessed more than 45,000 kilometres of Scottish waters, over 171 rivers and river groupings. We've had catch returns from more fisheries than ever before. We made improvements to the modelling process and discussion with fisheries interests. We've consulted over 1,500 stakeholders, had representations from 192 of them. And as in previous years, we have responded to concerns raised and indeed made adjustments to river gradings in a small number of cases where that was shown to be appropriate. Can the modelling be per further improved? Yes, uh, I think it probably can. Uh, we will uh, continue to invest in the coming uh, uh, financial year um, uh, to help uh, in terms of the assessments and we will consult with local bio biologists on the complementary model in spring 2019. But we need to be clear that responsible management approach that we are taking is not unique to Scotland. And nor are we alone in being so concerned about the health of our salmon stocks. Earlier this month, the Environment Agency launched a consultation on proposals to bring in mandatory catch and release on 32 of the 42 salmon rivers in England. Their proposal would bring in bylaws lasting for 10 years. And Ireland has taken the decision to close fishing entirely on a number of their salmon rivers. Well, we've not taken that decision, 
the conservation measures do allow rod and line fishing to continue in all of Scotland's salmon rivers. What they require, however, is that any salmon caught should be returned to the water uh, immediately where that's indicated uh, in a local area. So anglers can continue to fish. They simply cannot kill the fish on 122 rivers in Scotland. Now, I know uh, that there is a, a, a challenge for anglers and fishery, uh, fisheries managers alike, and particularly when it comes to grade three rivers, but we've got to protect fish ahead of fisheries because otherwise what we're doing is counterintuitive. And effectively, in the longer term, it jeopardises angling in a far greater way. So this approach gives our salmon the best chance while we continue the research, continue to tackle the wide range of pressures impacting our stocks. It is the right approach and it is the precautionary approach. And that precautionary approach is one, of course, which this committee would urge me to take across an entire range uh, of, uh, uh, of my portfolio, quite rightly. Indeed, but can I ask uh, why there is no formal right of appeal against the decisions that are reached in this area. Uh, we we uh, didn't feel that there was a, uh, a necessity to introduce that in that we would we take on board any uh, extra data or uh, scientific input, such as a difference in wetted area. Those are the, the you know anything that can be brought to brought to bear, we, any evidence that's brought to bear, we look at that and discuss that with uh, the local stakeholders. And some initial proposals in respect of these regulations for this year were in fact amended before we got to the, the stage of drafting the, uh, of drafting the regulations. There were some original proposals for rivers to be categorised in a particular way and the, there, was, there were changes made to that. So that process is ongoing. But, but there is dissatisfaction out there, perhaps predictable dissatisfaction. People are not going to be happy about some of these decisions. Wouldn't it be helpful in diffusing some of that if there was a formal process available to, um, with very strict criteria to be followed, i.e. you couldn't object because you just didn't like the decision. You had to have a scientific basis for objecting. Is that not something that's worth looking at going forward? Um. My in initial response to that is to remind, to remind the committee members that for us, this is an annual process. So you would almost be doing that on an annual basis. I just indicated that, for example, the consultation um, uh, for England is to bring in bylaws that would, would subsist for 10 yeah. years. And that is not what our, process, what our process is. Simon, do you want to? Perhaps just worth, worth clarifying as well, uh, we discussed the model with uh, local biologists representing uh, all of the regions of Scotland. Uh, so we have a, uh, ongoing meetings with them. We will meet with them at least three times each year uh, with the sole purpose of uh, discussing the modelling process, the data that we've got, and, and trying to enhance it. And that's why we refer to, in the last evidence session, changes to a national egg target and trying to have regional uh, egg targets. Uh, that is through discussion uh, with the local biologists. Now, this year's model, the local biologists said to us that they were far more confident with the outcome of the model for the 2018 season than they were for the model for the 2017 season. So the local bi biologists, what you might call the scientific experts, are signalling to us that the model has moved forward but acknowledging they'd like it to move forward one crucial step further, it's all about egg targets, as well as separately to have a juvenile model. And we've responded to, uh, are responding to both of those asks. Uh, as you noted in evidence last week, um, the other thing that came up last week was the issue of peer review. And it was indicated that that was being looked at. Cabinet Secretary, could you expand on that in any way? Um, I I think I, I, I saw something coming in last night uh, uh, in respect to this, and I think that we are, we are, we are happy to, con to, to, to build that into the process, that peer review into the process, if that, if that makes people feel happier um, about the way forward. I mean, that, that's an improvement of what is the current process, and I think that we would, that would be something that we'd be prepared to do. Okay, thank you. I'll open it up to colleagues. Um, Alex Rowley, followed by Finlay Carson. 
could, could, could I say, Colonel Secretary, I mean, the, the picture you paint is pretty bleak in many ways in terms of the, the, the waters of uh, Scotland and, and, and Wild Salmon. The problem, I think, was that certainly I didn't get the feeling last week from the committee evidence that was taking place that were actually on top of this. And there seemed to be quite a number of feelings, one being the engagement with the organisations, the angling fishing organisations that are actually running and managing these, these, these areas and these waters. It almost seems to be such a top-down process that's been adopted that, that I'm not sure it's the right way forward. One would have to assume that, that none of these organisations would want to allow uh, fishing to take place on their waters that would end up with no salmon in them whatsoever. Uh, and yet, yet these organisations have been indicating through, through writing to members of this committee their unhappiness about the, the whole process. So there is, there is questions there and the impact that, that this decision can have on the wider management of, of these, <coughs> these waterways. Uh, you have said yourself that, that there, there is a need for better uh, data to be able to be provided. I certainly wasn't left confident last week that the steps that were being, that were being proposed were actually going to um, achieve the outcomes that were being suggested. But that question of engaging more closely with the organisations that are responsible for the day-to-day -day management and running with these waterways and, and with these, these rivers and being able to give them a greater say and, and this question of just a top-down approach, this is how we're going to tackle this problem, which by your own admission we're not tackling because less fish, are, less salmon are coming back and there's less and less salmon every year. I just feel there's actually an urgency to this that what's being proposed here today is not going to tackle. Um, first off, I did indicate that we'd consulted over 1,500 stakeholders um, and from that group of 1,500, um, there were representations from 192 of them directly, and that was supportive and non-supportive. Um, so I think that's pretty extensive. There's a difference between consultation and proper engagement, I would suggest. Well, what, what would you propose then that, 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 that should be in, in place of that? Well, I, mean, I, suggest, I, I would suggest, for example, that these organisations who are running the, who are responsible for the day-to-day -day management of these rivers need to be engaged more so that they are actually becoming part of the solution, not objecting to the proposals being put forward. Uh, some of the... Uh, I would say we, we are engaging uh, directly uh, with, with some of the organisations that, that you uh, refer to. So, for example, on the River Endrick, we have both met with the Angling Association, a Loch Lomond Angling Improvement Association, on several occasions and had several meetings with the Loch Lomond Fisheries Trust. Now, the Loch Lomond Fisheries Trust is the trust that has the biologists, and we've discussed with, uh, with their biologist in detail uh, the situation. Uh, from a biological perspective, she is content with the, with the grading uh, that we are proposing, uh, albeit having concerns with, with, uh, with wider factors, but on the specific model, is content. I've met with a lot of a lot of angling clubs, uh, the ONS on the Cromarty tonight. I go for a meeting at Falkirk to, uh, at eight o'clock tonight to meet with that angling club uh, and have discussions. So we do take every opportunity. That the balance is between talking clearly and, and getting feedback and actually addressing the issues. And we feel that that with the, the merger fund we've announced, the, the five hundred thousand pounds of five hundred £1,000 of funding for the wild sector fisheries management tool. We have a lot of very positive activity going on at the moment. And, and I, I, I think it's also worth reminding people that when, when we're doing these regulations each year, that's on five years' data, um, and it's a rolling five years' data that we're looking at here. We're not simply looking at the situation between last year and this year. We're looking at the, pre, you know, five years, and I just, you know, need, need folk to... To, to, to remember that um, and, uh, uh, and, to, and to understand that that, that that science and a lot of the data that we, that we base this on is, is data which is meant to come in any case from the organisations. So the, the catch 
kind of the, the, the actual catch data comes from these organisations directly. A good year dropped off and a bad year came in. Yeah, and, and that may continue to be the situation. I think my understanding is, and again, I can be corrected by the people who are the actual experts here, that it will be 2020 before that, that problem period starts to phase back out again. And I just think I need to, you know, when, when we talk about the wild fisheries stocks in total, this is only one aspect of, of, of trying to deal with the conservation issues. There are, there are loads of other aspects to it. I mean, there are, you know, wild salmon are under a whole range of pressures um, uh, and, and, you know, we, we need to tackle across a whole range of pressures. I mean, for instance, last, last week or the week before, I announced money to go into the Northeast Rivers to help with goosander predation. And people don't normally think about that kind of predation as being part of the problem, but it is, and we're funding work on that as well. So, the, you know, th there's a huge range of pressures. And at the end of the day, it then gets felt in terms of fish numbers in the rivers. Um, and this is one aspect of what is a range of conservation measures um, that we're trying to uh, work across in order to get the fish stocks into a healthier state. Not the least of which would be the banning of netting, as has happened in some parts of the country. Uh, e well, I what do you want to talk about that. netting? <laughs> Currently, we, we have, uh, from when we introduced these measures in 2016, we also introduced a prohibition on the retention of salmon in coastal waters, which meant that coastal net netsmen effectively couldn't operate and at all. At all. Mm -hmm. And we're been paying uh, compensation to them uh, uh, for a three-year period whilst we review the science uh, and, and come review that mm -hmm. prohibition. Yeah. Okay, I should have declared a constituency interest in that. Uh, Finlay Carson. Thank you, Confina. Uh, first of all, can I stress that uh, myself and my colleagues do take salmon health uh, very seriously, and, and, and we really don't need reminded that uh, we're, we're all here to look after the, the salmon population. But why is it that the Scottish Government haven't made, in their own admission, satisfactory progress or investment in data collection, which would go some way to addressing the concerns that we've got today? Well, because data collection is something that we are continuing to improve. Some of the data collection depends on uh, the returns from uh, the, the rivers themselves, um, and that is getting better. Um, I, I think I'm right in saying in the last year there were a higher level of returns from rivers, and it may simply be because of the heightened discussion around this that people are more inclined to actually fill in the returns um, than, than perhaps they were previously. But that is getting, uh, that, that is getting a lot better, and we do depend on, on, that, sort of, uh, uh, on that sort of return uh, coming in. Um, but but so is there not a lot more to it than that? It's yep. not just about rod catches. For example, there are some rivers where the number of uh, fish caught has gone down and the rivers have been revised up the way. So we're not just talking about rod catching. You know, we went back in 2015, no, the, the Rural Affairs Committee science. suggested yeah. and tried to stress how important better scientific data was. And that, that, that's failed to come about. So we're sitting in the same position here in 2018 where there's real concerns that the regulations that are being brought in aren't on sound scientific basis. Well, I don't think that's true. I think that the science has been, has been uh, uh, getting more effective over the years. Um, I think sure. uh, Dr John Armstrong is probably the, the right person to talk about the details of the science. But it has been getting better. Data collection has been getting better. I indicated that there isn't a perfect model. We continue to refine uh, 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 the way we look at this, and we continue to engage uh, right across the board on that. Do you, do you want to come in, Dr John? Thank you, yes. Um, the, the model that's used is very sophisticated, uh, even by international standards, and it is so because we do collect a lot of data in Scotland. We have done for, for many decades. Um, indeed, it was in the, the 50s and 60s when we started exercises of uh, tagging smolts going out on the, on the North Esk and looking at adult returns, developing fish counters. Um, we have some traps on tributaries on the River Dee where we count fish out and we, we look at fish coming back in. And we have a, a very deep understanding of the population dynamics of salmon. And really, that's, that's why we're in a position where we can uh, apply these models. 
And I suppose, really, what option would we have without that science? Probably just to stop, to stop exploitation if one was being precautionary. But we can get a, a reasonable idea. There's, there's always some uncertainty in models of biological models. But we can get a reasonable idea of where we have stocks that are sufficient still to, to allow some exploitation. So I think it's because of the science we have that, that we can actually run this system. It, That's not to say it, it, it can't get better. It's not a, a model that's peculiar to Scotland either. Um, we haven't somehow invented our own model um, to suit our own purposes. And I think Norway um, is, is broadly the same uh, uh, novel uh, modelling uh, uh, system uh, as well. So we've not, we've not created a, a vehicle that is, that is only for Scotland. Um, you know, we've, we've, we're, we're sharing... Uh, uh, that expertise too, which I think is important to say. Okay, I, I've got a number of members wishing to come in. Uh, Mark Roscoe will be followed by Donald Cameron. Yeah. Thanks, convener. Um, I just wanted to ask about the, the evolution of that model then, um, away from catch data. Um, and, and, you know, there has been a bit of criticism around the catch data and around the variability of that, and, you know, anglers going out in the rain, for example. I mean, I've had all sorts of um, points that have been raised directly with me through letters, and, and you know, it's been, been useful to have those. But in, in terms of um, moving the model forward, then, to one that's based on egg targets and monitoring of juveniles, and I think the welcome commitment around peer review of this, so it can be tested to destruction. Will that be in place for next year? I think the intention is that it will be able to inform next year's assessment. Right. OK. I, I, I don't know whether Strong wants to make well, I, I, more I, detail of that. Sure. I, I think what we would want to do is to um, construct that model. Uh, we certainly need some data to go into it, and I, I think, as my colleague has said, there, there is a fund that will enable some collection of appropriate data, so that has to happen. And what we do, we, we, we do internally peer review, in a sense, within Scotland, because we have the Salmon Liaison Group, um, which has representative biologists from River Trusts around Scotland, and they certainly have an intense look at, at what's happening. And I think the right process would be for them to have a look at the proposed models, and we would then discuss to make sure that they were happy with that. So I think there is that peer review, uh, and we would have to see how we could then best apply it. I, That's the process I was envisaging. And I think as I, I said earlier that the, the, the approach that we're using is a standard process used elsewhere, for example, in Norway. That itself has been peer reviewed in a number of places, and it might be helpful, I suppose, while we're, while we're looking at peer reviewing the... The, the, the tweaked version for Scotland that we perhaps can track down some of the peer reviews of the standard model as, as, as used, mm -hmm. for example, in Norway, if that would be helpful, because yeah. that has been peer reviewed. Okay. I think that would be useful. Can okay. I just, just another very quick supplement, which is really on, on the back of um, some of the concerns raised by Alex Rowley, and it's really about how do we support fisheries trusts and associations going forward. Uh, it's been raised uh, with me, for example, the Fourth Fisheries Trust can't get access to SRDP funding, although they're doing a lot of fantastic work in riparian areas on non-native invasive species. So I, I just sort of raise that maybe as, as an issue in terms of eligibility for grant funding, um, the suitability of some of these grants to actually support the excellent work that both the trusts and the associations actually do. I mean, that's a wider point. I know, yeah. given that we've just had an hour and something talking about the likelihood in not very many years' time, there'll be no SRDP funding. Um, uh, we would have to depend entirely on what the new funding setup is, what kind of money there might be able to be made available. But, you know, that, the, the, the issue of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of supporting people through this process uh, is something um, that we constantly do look at. I mean, we did make money as, and I know that Finlay Carson wasn't particularly happy with the fish pal um, process, but there was money made available there, as I indicated, you know, put money into northeast uh, 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 fisheries in respect of work that they're trying to do and support work they're doing there. So it's not that we don't. It's, it comes back to our friend, you know, the budget issue of, just how much money there is available to do this, and um, as was indicated, uh, you know there are there is a category of uh, uh, salmon fishermen whose practices have been um, stopped completely. So there is money 
going there to compensate them for what is effectively the end of an economic um, uh, um, activity that they were taking, that you know they were they were doing. So yes, we can go away and have a look at whether or not there are other potential funding sources, other ways in which local groups can think about maybe tweaking some of what they do to bring it into a category for a different um, uh, grant uh, or fund. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, we will end up in a situation where there will be a finite amount of money and decisions would have to be made then about where best to spend it. Thank you. Uh, John Scott. Thank you very much, um, convener. Um, and um, good morning, uh, gentlemen, cabinet secretary. Uh, I suppose we all accept and want to protect salmon and their rivers and their habitats. And it's already been acknowledged that salmon are under a whole range of pressures, in my view, least of which is angling. Uh, so, of course, we share your concerns, but we feel, and I certainly I feel, that the instrument is flawed, it's based on poor science. Um, no one appears to have confidence in the science that has not been peer-reviewed, and it might not stand up to that level of scrutiny. That's the whole point about peer review. Uh, even witnesses at the REC committee last week uh, were, were unhappy uh, when this was brought up in the margins uh, about the science and the quality of the science. So I, I, we, of course, support the intention of the instrument, and but the, we feel that the protest demonstrates the need. Uh, and the Cabinet Secretary has essentially admitted it's insufficient and inadequate by, by her own admission. I mean, this should have almost been... A, an affirmative instrument. Now, I appreciate the process is not there to, make, to allow that process to be brought forward, but given the level of discussion, the debate around this, the uncertainty and the untested science that, that does appear to surround it, notwithstanding the protective principle which we all adhere to on this committee, but we feel that the whole thing is, is utterly flawed. Well, I don't know how to respond to that. I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is, um, uh, that it is one thing in a range of things we're trying to do in respect of salmon numbers. Um, uh, I, I wouldn't pretend that this could be an only solution. Of course it can't be the only solution. Um, but there are some figures I think the committee perhaps just needs to think about. In 2016, around 5,500 salmon were retained by anglers. But in the preceding five-year period, the average was around 15,500 now, that's a significant reduction, and, you know, the, the, the fact is, and I accept that um, a lot of anglers won't be happy at not being able to take uh, a fish or take more fish, um, uh, but they are, by this mechanism, making a contribution to salmon survival. They're not going to, on their own, solve the problem any more than these regulations and the categorization of the rivers is going to solve the problem. But I don't think we've ever put this forward as a single solution to the problem of salmon numbers. I'm, I'm very well aware that there are many pressures on salmon, and I've indicated already in my evidence, in some cases, you know, to where we've put money to, to deal with other pressures uh, uh, on salmon. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the issue is trying to address the pressures Yes, but also taking steps which will reduce the pressure in the short term in order to ensure that in the longer term there are healthy fish stocks for everybody, including anglers. And that's where we are. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a scientist, um, so I have to rely on the advice of scientists. And the advice of the scientists is that this is the way forward. This is what's happening in Norway. The, the situation in England is likely to be even more uh, uh, restrictive. And as I indicated in Ireland, they've shut rivers to fishing completely because of the scenario that we're looking at. So in actual fact, what we're doing in Scotland is, is a, you know, a, a lesser uh, 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 um, uh, compared to that. I mean, you know, ultimately that may be where we ended up if we weren't going to do this as we've done it. Okay. Um, 
Thank you. I, I know it's colleagues getting a bit agitated to get in here. <laughs> I will get to everyone to ask questions, but I've got rather a long list in front of me. Joan McAlpine will be followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, two, two very quick uh, points. Uh, first of all, can I say that I was very pleased that the NITH uh, is a Category uh, 1 this year, and I was very pleased to open the salmon uh, season there by toasting the river. Um, they are going to continue to practice catch and release, you'll be very pleased to hear. Uh, so um, uh, I think that's a testament to the, to the management on that river. Unfortunately, parts of the NITH... Uh, further downstream and also the Annan are our category three. Um, when I wrote to you last uh, year, you said that you were in discussions with the fisheries boards of those two rivers uh, to talk about uh, a bid for money for a fish counter to cover both the rivers. So uh, I wonder if you could give us an update on that. Um, and yeah, thanks. Uh, yes, the, the, uh, the Annan and the Nith were unable to come to put together a joint proposal uh, to bid for fish counters to cover both catchment areas. So uh, the NIF are proceeding on their own uh, and I understand have a bid in with the, the local uh, flag uh, to get funding through that route. Right, okay. My, thank you very much. My second question uh, was regards to uh, half netting. Um, half netting is a unique uh, form of fishing practice by very few people uh, on, on the Solway. Um, if we talk about salmon being endangered, half netters are probably even more endangered than salmon. Um, uh, the First Minister in 2016 made a commitment that um, half netting on the Annan would be uh, uh, become a historic fishery. And I know that in Scotland's implementation plan uh, for the 2013-2018 NASCO guidelines, um, you say that consideration will be given to the heritage value of fisheries, where fish methods are unique to a small number of locations, uh, and consideration would be given in those circumstances to uh, continuing retaining uh, a residual fishery and even permitting a very small level of catch. So, given the commitment made by the first minister and the, you know, the very unique nature of uh, half netting, I wonder if you could give us an update on where we are with ensuring that this unique practice that dates back to Viking times can continue. Well, um, we've provided grant funding to the Royal Borough of Annan Common Good Fund to help them promote half netting as a cultural activity. Um, uh, and under the current legislation, yes, it is only permitted in the Solway area, half netting. Um, uh, it, it doesn't um, go uh, beyond that. Um, and uh, all fishermen are, are, are having to take a share of the effort involved in the work that we're currently doing to try and conserve salmon. So, you know, that, that includes... Uh, uh, all kinds of fishery. Um, uh, so, yes, we are promoting, helping them promote, ha uh, promote half netting as a cultural activity, but the issue is still about killing fish, uh, ultimately. It's like, you know, these regulations don't ban angling, but they ban killing the fish in certain rivers. And that's what it comes down to. Okay. Uh, do you want to continue? Yeah, I, I could just come in very, very quickly. You know, obviously, there are, you know, like you say, all fishermen, whether they're anglers or netters or half netters, are affected. But, well, you know, we do you concede, as, as indeed your own guidelines concede, and as the First Minister conceded, that, you know, half netting is, it is different. It affects a very small number of people. It dates back to Viking times. You know, from a cultural point of view, in terms of Scottish culture, in terms of um, intangible cultural heritage, um, under the UNESCO um, uh, definition of intangible cultural heritage, that kind of human human activity is worth preserving as well. And money is going into that. Thanks. Jackie Bailey to be followed by Richard Lyle. Thank you very much, convener. Um, I think it's fair to say that the Loch Lomond Angling Improvement Association waited a considerable period, something like 18 months to two years, before there was any engagement um, by the Scottish Government, and what it has amounted to appears to be a tick box exercise. Now, I think last time round, Mr Dryden acknowledged that the data is incomplete, um, and you know, even despite a meeting with the Loch Lomond Fisheries Trust, um, the Government is unable to identify all proprietors, they don't know the catch data because there isn't data on all returns. And the improving model and methodology amounts, it appears to me, to be guesswork. And three hand-drawn maps, 
that I have to say probably look as if they've been done by a five-year-old. Um, so I, I really struggle that this is evidence-based. I wonder whether I could put to the Cabinet Secretary, uh, the Loch Lomond Association provided catch returns dating back to 1956. Um, these show one fish less caught than was recorded in 2016. But in 1956, there were double the number of members there and there wasn't seen to be a shortage. Um, could the Cabinet Secretary or perhaps Dr Armstrong explain that? I think Dr Armstrong is probably in a better <laughs> position to explain it than I am. Whether he can is another matter. I, I'd obviously have to have a look at the data to, um, to see the detail of it. It's difficult to say just from that what the situation is. OK, so you accept that in the 50s there was considered to be a lot of salmon, a lot more members fishing, yet the, the catch return is equivalent to what it is today? I... The, the, just as a, a point, in the, in the 1950s, uh, we, we had a, uh, a strong uh, coastal netting fishery. Uh, so uh, uh, that was take it, catching a lot of the salmon that were uh, returning to rivers. So uh, when, you, when you take away that coastal netting fishery, you would have anticipated that the catch numbers, if, if we still had high returns, would have gone up. And we, we haven't seen that. So we... OK, let me put the reverse position to you. And this was something raised by Gail Ross, one of our colleagues, um, about the River Leaven at the Rural Economy Committee. Not my River Leaven, but a River Leaven elsewhere, where everybody agrees that catches have substantially declined. Evidence given to the committee states that there were not salmon caught there over a number of years, but because last year one Pacific salmon was caught, that's now graded as a grade one. Does that not seem, in the, the words of one witness, entirely bizarre? Uh, hopefully I can, can answer that. The, uh, firstly, the uh, 2017 season's catches uh, haven't been uh, published yet, and, and they don't go into the, uh, the model. So if the River Leven has had a very poor season this season, that, that won't be reflected no, really. uh, in the model. And I understand and saw the evidence that... Uh, uh, John Gibb gave. Uh, uh, what's, what's interesting, perhaps, will help understand is that the River Leven in, in, in Venetia, it, its uh, catchment area is very small. So comparatively, if I use the River Endrick's catchment area as an example, uh, the River Leven's is 6%. Its catchment area of just over 26,000 metres squared is only 6%. Of the river, uh, of, of the Endrick system. So it's a very small system. Uh, what we saw in uh, in 2000, uh, in the last five years, four of those years, four out of the last five years in the assessment, our model says that it's 100% likelihood of reaching its conservation limit. And in one year, in 2015, they had zero catch. So you have four years at 100%, one year at 0%. That gives you an average over the five years of 80%. Uh, uh, now, in 2016, just 38 salmon, roughly, I think, were, were caught. And what we're saying is that that represents just about 10% of the salmon that went up the river. So approximately between 350 and 400 salmon, our model would say, would have gone up the river in uh, 2016. And that does represent enough salmon to, to meet the egg target, and our model says with 100% certainty. Now, those figures are a lot less. 38 is, is a low number of salmon, but it's because the wetted area is so, so small. I think, though, your model flies in the face of local experience and local expertise, which is the thing that, that's concerning people. Could I move on to my final question on the equality impact assessment? Um, there's a letter from a uh, constituent, Peter Lyons, who's been shared with the committee. He's disabled, he's got severe mo mobility problems, he fishes in the Loch Lomond River system um, and is unable to fish elsewhere. He's clearly described the problems he's encountered. I wonder, um, could the Cabinet Secretary tell me or somebody tell me who completed the Equality Impact Assessment, when did they do it, who did they consult in doing it, or was it simply a desk-based exercise? I, well, I don't think there is a formal equality impact assessment done for these regulations, oh. and it was decided, and I think the, uh, oh. notwithstanding the expression of surprise on Jackie Bailey's face, I think she probably oh. already knew that. No? Um, there isn't a, a, a formal equalities impact assessment process done for this, although equalities are 
uh, taken into, uh, into consideration. Can I, can I just remind everybody, the actual practice of angling is not barred. It's the taking the fish that is stopped. Okay. In, in the case that I have supplied to the committee, um, the taking of the fish is, is something that this constituent requires to do. Otherwise, he will end up capsized and in the water because he only has one arm. Okay, so there are very specific protected characteristics here um, that just have not been considered. We were led to believe by your predecessor and indeed um, by the officials that there was an equality impact assessment. So clearly one's not, not a formal been done. one. It's not a formal, it's not, okay. it doesn't go through the normal formal process for equality impact assessment, if I'm, if I'm correct. Perhaps I'm misleading the committee. What, what, uh, what Policies we... are looked at, but not in the formal sense of an equality impact assessment. Well, Mr Dryden, it... is that the case? Yes, what we said, uh, we, have, we have not been able to find uh, the equality impact assessment uh, that was said that was done at the time of the 2016 regulations. But we, as a result of the comments by Ms Bailey, we've looked at the Equalities Impact Assessment for the 2018 regulations. And the, and the process uh, uh, is that you, uh, uh, you identify whether you believe it is necessary to carry one out. And, and we've looked at the situation, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, and has said on this, on balance, uh, we do not believe we, uh, that we need to take any follow through the process. We get to stage one, and that stage one allows us to say, right, we've looked at this. We, we do not believe we need to take it further. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Richard Lyle to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener. And John Scott's point, I can count how many people are in a room. I can count them possibly how many uh, sheep are in a, in a field. But I, I would suggest it's very hard to count how many fish are in the sea or how many fish are in a river at the end of the day. Um, no one can disagree that wild salmon is under pressure and no one likes change, but we have to change. So can I ask you, if we don't agree with this uh, today, how many um, rivers does this affect? And could we possibly, how many people have objected and could we possibly exclude the objectors to let them fish in. And I get the point the Cabinet Secretary said, bear with me, um, I, I get the point you said that basically it's they're catching the fish, they're not taking it home to eat, they're putting it back in the river. So why are people objecting? Well, OK, I mean, I think people, I suppose, uh, if they're accustomed to doing something in a certain way over a long period and it, it is proposed to change that, folk in general terms find that quite challenging. Um, uh, in a lot of the rivers that we're talking about, you will speak to anglers who will openly say to you, yeah, they know that there are issues, and for that reason, they've been, they've been uh, doing a sort of voluntary catch and release and maybe only taking one fish in a season themselves just as a, a, you know, as a, as a kind of nominal uh, thing. So, I mean, I, I suppose my response would be that anglers are frequently in a position where it's the actual activity of the angling rather than the killing of the fish, which is, which is important. Um, and, I, and I just go back to what I said, you know, unlike in some other jurisdictions, we're not stopping the fishing, we're stopping the actual killing. And in many places that might only be one fish that an angler might have taken uh, over over uh, over a season. Um, I understand if it's you know it's a sport that many people enjoy, uh, uh, like many other sports. And for those who are in the areas where uh, their uh, local rivers are the ones that are categorised effectively as uh, as as no take um, zones, it, it is difficult. But at the end of the day. This is about the longer term, and it's about the anglers of the future as well. It's about having um, uh, decently stocked salmon rivers in Scotland for all anglers uh, in the future. Um, and, you know, I, I really, at the end of the day, that's what it comes back down to. The point I'm trying to make is, if we don't pass this today, we could affect every river in Scotland. Mm -hmm. and, and, and also... 
I'm, I'm on your side, by the way. No, I understand. The point, the point I'm making is, if, there, if we don't pass this today, every river in Scotland will be affected. We've only, to my mind, a few rivers who are, are a few um, angler associations who are objecting. So, could we? My question is, could we exclude them? You know, I know I get the science. I get that we need to do something. I get that. Basically, I've never fished a day in my life, but I get the excitement is catching a fish mm -hmm. and then releasing it back into the... You know, that should give people satisfaction. I you're conserving, you're also yeah. uh, still maintaining your sport. So why can't we do that? Or can we do that? Can we exclude the objectors so we don't affect I, every I, other I river in, with, in Scotland? With, you know, with the kind of thing of national governance here, I think if you say that all that has to happen in a particular area is that somebody objects and then that means that area gets excluded, uh, I suspect that this year would be the only year in which a handful of objections were affected. Uh, next year, everybody would object everywhere uh, and we would be back to square one. So I don't think from a national governance perspective that's a particularly helpful way forward. And it may be that Richard Lyle is deliberately being provocative in putting that forward as a solution so that I have to say that that doesn't really work. You got um, it in one. <laughs> okay, uh, Claudia Beamish to be followed by Liz Smith and finally Kate Forbes. Thank you, convener, and uh, good morning again, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning to <laughs> your, your officials. Uh, still morning. Um, in terms, I've, I've got five questions and I will try to be brief because some of them have been partly covered already but I want to highlight points within them. Um, in relation to the scale of concerns that we had a response which we were appreciative of as a committee um, uh, from last week's evidence taking. Um, with the, regard to the content of the concerns received, um, I, I quote, many sought to criticise the general modelling and I quote further, and this is my question, um, many of the issues have been addressed at the time the conservation measures were first introduced. Um, in, in view of the fact that I was a member of that committee, could um, somebody please highlight for me what those measures, what those issues were that were addressed at the time in 2016? Okay. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't the Cabinet Secretary at the time, right. so I'm afraid I wasn't intimately involved in the first set of regulations coming through. I don't know if either of my two colleagues here were part of that conversation. That is always one of the difficulties. Simon, were I you? I have an attempt at, at describing what, what I believe we've uh, uh, addressed. The, f the first is to move from uh, regional areas, which was the first. Uh, we had a lot of regions the first time we'd moved to uh, assess 171 uh, groups, which means that we, we have far more granularity in it. Uh, that the second from what? Sorry, from you've uh, moved 271 from to 171, and, and forgive me, I, I roughly don't, a uh, ballpark. I mean, this is this was my next question, so it would answer it. And we'd be down to only three, but I, I mean, it is really important to understand because this came before us um, f uh, two years ago, and one of the reassurances we were given by um, the the officials was that there would be more granularity. OK, I have got those figures, sorry. Thank you. So in 2016, we did uh, uh, approximately 100 regions. I can't, my maths isn't good enough to exact number, that's all right. And then in, uh, in 2017, we moved to more granularity, uh, and that looks like 150 in round figures. And then in this season, we've moved to 171. So, is this work in progress? How, is Absolutely. there a lot are, more that uh, needs there are to be still, done? That not a lot more. There are right. still some... Uh, we use the, the, the phrase rivers and assessment groups because there are some groups. Uh, and I'm sorry, within, within this 171, I, I'm, I, I think we are less than a dozen groups. Okay, okay. Right. so so the, so the major, vast majority, I'm saying, at around about 160, are we're assessing an indi at an individual river right. level. Okay, but there thank are you. Some That's groups. helpful. Was that that needed clarity? Um, my own view. It's a personal view. I I have been um, salmon fishing with a fly, but I never caught anything since my father died. So there we go. That was a long time ago. But I have a limited knowledge of it. But. I, I understand there are a lot of rivers, whatever grade they are, even if they're grade one, who do practice catch and release as well. But what worries me, 
partly is taking stakeholders with us. And as I say, it's only a personal view, but my view is that um, there is a really quite poor improvement in the, the science and data arrangements and modelling since 2016. I find that disappointing in terms of the gaps in the science and uh, in terms of uh, two points I would make, one of which has already been made, so I'll be very brief on that, um, but um, the egg estimates, and I do understand that Marine um, uh, Scotland Science is looking, and I quote, for to develop a more focused regional, more focused regional targets for egg um, uh, deposition, uh, taking account of local habitat and conditions, uh, which will provide a more accurate estimate of the abundance in future years. I mean, we've had two years on that, and I, I, you know, I welcome response on that, but just to cover the other points, fishing effort has been highlighted to me particularly, and how has that been taken into account? Uh, also, I had hoped um, two years ago that the issues around juvenile um, fish would have been developed much more than they have, as I understand it, uh, up to now. There's um, fish counters have only moved from six fish counters to eight, and so on the science, I really do have concerns about the lack of progress. So could there be comment on any of that, please, from yourself? Sure, yeah. Um, where shall I start? With the uh, fish counters. Um, these are large structures that go in rivers, might cost in the order of £100,000 to install and take a lot of effort to run. Um, so it's, it's a major undertaking to, to, to put in fish counters, but we certainly will be having a look to see what opportunities there are. But what look have you had so far? So from six to eight, I understand that there has to be planning permission, I understand it's complex, I understand you know, how far can the salmon leap and all that, but it seems it's not much of an improvement in two years. What, that, bringing in those extra counters has been having a look at what's already available in Scotland. So we, mm -hmm. we need to, it will be a major leap to go forward to a network of counters and that will require substantial planning and finance. Right. So I get an understanding of this. To what extent you're removing barriers from, for salmon on some rivers, to what extent the counters present barriers? Is there a conflict there in the two approaches? There is. One has to be very careful um, because you, you need to obstruct salmon to some extent to count them. Mm -hmm. um, we're working with SEPA and with SNH having a look at existing barriers to see what potential there might be for installing counters in barriers that might well be removed. So that would um, give us a balance, if you like, between improving things by okay. taking a barrier out, but also putting a counter in to take the opportunity to, to, to get more information. Okay, sorry. Right, no, thank you. Uh, were there any other comments on the, the, my perception and understanding personally that um, the science progress is disappointing? Sure, I'll come on to the, um, the juveniles. Um, the, the models being used for using juveniles, again, are very sophisticated, mm. and, and there isn't anything in existence at the moment that would do the, the proper job for Scotland. Our team has been developing models um, using GIS geographic information systems coupled with population dynamics models, and that is very well advanced. Um, in fact, I would anticipate that we'll be publishing or, or peer reviewing uh, that this year. That's, that's well underway. So that, I, I think we're, we're pleased with the progress on that. Um, and I, I'm afraid it does, it does take time. These are not easy things to deal with. In terms of the more general adult model, um, there's been quite a lot of development uh, looking at how we can better understand the relationship between flows and catches, which reduces quite a lot of uncertainty. Um, and we now have uh, methods where we can account for fish that are coming into rivers out of season, which was an issue that was particular concern on the urn, for example. So there's, there's quite substantial developments. Um, and I think the team who've been working on this have, have put in a huge amount of, of effort. I think it's, I, I understand that if, if you're not involved in the technical side, uh, one imagines things can probably happen at a, a faster pace than is, is realistic, but I can assure you there's been a lot of progress. And in relation to effort, could you just um, comment on that, one of you, please? Yes, I mean... How that affects the... the yep. I, I think it's uh, where one has counters and catch data, one can 
best deal with the, the issue of effort changing. We, we, we have tried to collect effort from fisheries, but it's an extremely difficult thing to do in any realistic way. So I, I don't disagree at all that having additional counters will improve uh, the quality of the modelling. Mm -hmm. And my last um, two questions are indeed very brief. Um, but the, the, yeah, the ownership issues... Um, this is a real concern that was raised um, by committee members last week. And uh, can you give some clarification as to riparian owners and why this hasn't been able to be addressed? For instance, um, uh, I know that in um, uh, my friend and colleague Jackie Bailey's constituency, this has been an issue, and I believe it has been elsewhere. Yes, because this really does yeah. make for flaws in the, in, in the assessments. Yep. Yes, I, and I'm sorry, I didn't pick up on the term la, at the last committee here, riparian owners. Uh, uh, the uh, the Herifal salmon fishing rights don't mm. don't necessarily reside with the riparian owner, with the owner of the riverbank, mm -hmm. uh, as indeed the, uh, I think we put in our response to the committee, the association, the association, Lot Loan Angling mm -hmm. Improvement Association, has some ownership mm. of uh, uh, Herifal angling rights. So, so uh, we find ourselves literally saying, well, we don't. Uh, we can approach the local landowner, but when they say they don't have the rights, then it's an open book. Where, where do we go? Uh, we have uh, made but some... Can I just stop you, though? You, uh, is that seriously the case, that, uh, that a landowner wouldn't know who, who had the rights to the fishing? I find that very puzzling. Yes, I, I think because when they, when they buy the property or the land, that they're... That, Often salmon rights might not be uh, yeah, discussed or that. part of it, so now, yeah, but I'm not sure why they they would necessarily. Well, it, well, There's I suppose the, the fact is on, that when we do ask on the land, Go, accessing it through their land, and you know, it doesn't seem to be. But yes, if, if indeed that's happening, and then they stop and say to that angler, "Who did? Uh, do you have the salmon rights here, or please can you tell me?" who you got permission from to come and fish, fish this, if indeed you did get permission. Uh, you know, I, I don't, we, we don't have circumstance that that's done. The, uh, well, the Registers of Scotland, when they were taking the ownership rights and putting them onto electronic systems, hmm. uh, we've established that the salmon rights weren't transferred. So uh -huh. what we need to do if we're uh, going to Registers of Scotland is we need, need to get out the paper records to uh, identify who has the salmon rights. Right. I just think in terms of stakeholder confidence, that might be useful because there are gaps, obviously, and, and that doesn't help with the collection of robust scientific data, I would suggest. Um, could I just ask you finally about the BRIA um, in terms of costs and mitigations? Just for the record, what you've, you've highlighted the Annan Common Good, which is in uh, my area and also um, Joan McAlpine's area. Um, there have been concerns raised about what was it raised in 2016 about the possibilities of, of that. And again, in terms of stakeholder confidence, I think that is an important issue. If you could perhaps highlight what, what has been done. I suspect the yeah, question is how much money has been spent on doing things in the last two years. Is that what you're... Well, to, su to support those who, um, like the Common Good Fund um, in Annan, who have highlighted to me that they have lost, um, uh, they've lost money because of um, the situation with their grading in 2016, for instance. Are, are there any others you could highlight to us as well? Oh, I, think, I think it's all right, Cabinet Secretary. I say that the, uh, Several things have happened with, with the, the grading on the financial side. The Crown Estate have reduced the lease levels to, uh, 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 f for their fisheries that are being leased by angling clubs uh, to take account of grade three. Uh, the national assessors have, for netting stations uh, that are in a grade three area, have zero rated their uh, stations so that they don't anymore pay salmon levy. Uh, we've just announced this month uh, 500, an additional £500,000 for this coming financial year uh, to uh, accelerate uh, both the research into the pressures onto uh, salmon stocks and to uh, do substantive activities in river to, uh, to try and improve the situation. So a significant proportion of that funding will go to local trusts to, to enable them to collect and supply us with, with data. Thank you. 
Thank you. And, and the ever patient Liz Smith. Thank you, Convener, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to put on the record why I've been unhappy about this uh, instrument. And my comments very much reflect the considerable engagement I've had with uh, anglers and fish experts in my own area of Mid Scotland and Fife, which have persuaded me that the uh, model data set that is being used to determine the categorisation of rivers is flawed. And I listened very carefully to your committee last Tuesday and also to the committee session at the Rural Affairs and Connectivity Committee last Wednesday. And I, I do believe that this is a general concern across Scotland, and I think it goes across the political parties. Can I stress at the outset that I think the angling community recognises its responsibilities with fish conservation, very much in line with the EU Habitats Directive, and they also recognise the very important responsibility that the Scottish Government has in this respect, and exactly in the way that Rosanna Cunningham said at the outset. There is no doubt that protection of fish species is vital, and I think it's very important to put that on the record. Secondly, I think the Cabinet Secretary is quite right when she says that it would never be possible to have perfect knowledge of every single river across Scotland. But that said, the overriding concern is the absence of sufficiently robust scientific analysis to underpin policy making. An analysis which can provide a comprehensive overview of the river system in Scotland, which can stand the test when it comes to peer review and which can be objectively used as a basis for the right to appeal policy decisions. I think the anglers are very quick to recognise the very important evidence that's been produced by the biologists uh, relating to egg deposition, something that Marine Scotland uh, asserts is a very established methodology and that's obviously employed in other countries like uh, Norway and Ireland, England and Wales. But in relation to the claim that was made by Marine Scotland that there is a very important Scottish dimension to be considered, uh, the anglers are very clear indeed that the current assessment of sustainability in Scottish rivers depends on two sources of data on numbers of fish returning to rivers that are unsound. They make the point that the existence of only eight river counters which have had data counters uh, and put, put upon them makes it very difficult to extrapolate results for other uh, rivers and that the current Marine Scotland method of analysis only complicates things further. And secondly, there is very much the issue of the rod catches, which apply only during the fishing season, and therefore they don't take account of fish runs before or after these dates, or of uncaught fish during the season. As I understand uh, matters, assurances have been provided to the angling community on several different occasions, including in 2016, uh, that there would be improvements made to the modelling. But I think the angling community feels uh, quite strongly that this has not been in any way significant. There have been delays uh, in, in engaging with angling bodies, which, uh, including Jackie Bailey, uh, two other members have uh, agreed has been a problem. And I was also aware of the circumstances in January 2017, when in the minutes of the Salmon Liaison Group, uh, stated that action was being taken to convene a productivity habitat quality group to develop individual river targets, but that um, didn't happen in the way that was intended. Uh, convener, at the last week's session of the committee, there was an admission, a very strong admission from Marine Scotland, that there are significant inadequacies within the modelling process. Uh, something that was put to them on the 23rd of September 2015 at the former Rural Affairs Committee, under extensive uh, questioning by my former colleague Alex Ferguson and also by Mike Russell. So I don't think anybody should be surprised in any way by the current concerns. Just to sum up, these concerns go well beyond our rivers. They relate to the sustainability of local economies, to tourism, to the leisure and sporting industries, and of course to the declining membership of our angling clubs. It is vital that these concerns have to be balanced against the important need to conserve fish stocks, perhaps not easily reconciled, but surely we'd be better placed to make that judgment if the data and the methods on which policy is based is on international science and it is open to quality peer review. Marine Scotland has acknowledged that there are very significant issues still to be addressed, so it is uh, my contention that this uh, instrument um, is a real problem, and I think we need urgent action to address uh, the situation so that policy is put on a sure footing for the future. Thank you. We, uh, Cabinet Secretary, if you could just hold that thought. Um, Ms Smith was a little bit ahead of us, so we haven't actually moved to the... Um, we haven't moved any yet, that's fine. Um, can we hold that thought? Or do you wish to respond at this stage? Well, I, I think we can go over and over and over again on the issues about science, about uh, you know the changes that are already been made, will continue to be made, 
Um, the fact that the model is not a one-off model for Scotland, it is you know, a similar model to being used elsewhere. Um, I hear what people are saying, but uh, 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 you know, the, the, the effectively, and I don't want to leap over into the next bit, um, but effectively, uh, we, we have to take action. And you know, uh, uh, I've said right from the outset, there's nothing perfect about this, um, I doubt whether we'll ever have a perfect uh, system, uh, but it continues to be refined um, and it will continue to be refined. Thank you. Okay, we now move to the consideration of motion S5M11020, which asks the committee to annul the Conservation of Salmon Scotland Amendment Regulations 2018, SSI 2018 forward slash 37. It should be noted that the Scottish Government officials cannot take part in the formal debate. I remind the committee that substitute members have the right to vote. Well, non-committee members can't vote. They can speak in the debate. The motion will be moved with an opportunity for a formal debate on the SSI, which can procedurally last up to 90 minutes. I invite Liz Smith to speak to and move the motion. Uh, thank you, convener. I uh, move the motion and I move it on the basis of the comments that I've just provided to the committee. Uh, thank you very much, Ms Smith. Uh, do any members wish to speak on this issue? Richard Lyle. Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly against, uh, with the greatest respect to my colleague, I'm against this, you know. So what, do we do? so what do we do? Do we sit and count every salmon that goes up and down a river? It's been suggested that uh, we annul this subledge. I just love conservationists, but when it comes down to the local area, they're against conservation. Let's be, be clear, we vote this instrument down and we'll put wild salmon at risk in Scottish rivers and we'll be tied us when anglers have nothing to fish. I, I move against uh, this uh, annulment. Uh, thank you, Mr Lyle, thank you for your brevity. Uh, Jackie Bailey. I will try to be equally as brief, but I suspect I might fail, convener. Um, let, let, let me just say that, you know, all rivers are different, and I don't think a one-size solution um, fits all is, is where we should be. Um, can I just refute Richard Lyle's comments? All of the anglers that I have spoken to are conservationists. They absolutely understand the need to conserve salmon stocks, and I think everybody around this table would agree um, with that sentiment too. But what they would argue is that we should do it properly and it should be based on evidence. Now, it strikes me we have successive Scottish governments um, telling us that evidence-based policy making is the thing, it's important. Um, but the evidence in the case of Loch Lomond and the Endrick system is entirely lacking. There's been limited, late engagement. I've described it previously as the 11th hour, 59th minute. I'm probably being kind, but it's an indication that people are not serious about the categorization that has been arrived at. And we are faced with people with decades of experience, witnesses to the Rural Economy Committee, local anglers who understand their river systems, all saying that the science is flawed. And it is depressing, convener, that two years on, we're back here having the same arguments as we had previously because the matter has not been fixed. Now, to me, the, the, the so-called improving model and methodology amounts in the case of Loch Lomond and the Endrick to guesswork. If you look at the Endrick, there's no data on catch returns. They're unable to identify all proprietors. And as I indicated earlier, we are relying as science on hand-drawn maps that, frankly, a five-year-old um, could have done better. It is also clear, convener, that there has been no equality impact assessment um, thought through at all. Recognition um, from Mr Dryden that no consideration has been given to those with protected characteristics because the process stopped at the very first stage and it was clearly a desk-bound process. Um, Peter Lyons, um, evidence submitted to this committee, um, his case perfectly describes the lack of consideration given to equalities. And this is, in my view, a fatal flaw on a parliament that prides itself equally on taking equalities into consideration. So overall, I would regard it as disappointing. I would urge committee members, I don't have a vote, um, but I would encourage them um, to support the motion to annul. Loch Lomond Angling Association has been around for 118 years. More than this parliament has certainly been around. Um, they engage in a low cost activity. <coughs> it's predominantly engaged in by working class men, 40% um, of who have protected characteristics. They care passionately 
about conservation, but they reject the categorization because it's based on flawed science, there's little, been little consultation, there's a lack of data on catch returns, they're unable to identify the owners, and we have hand-drawn maps. Actually, you know, I would urge the Scottish Government to take the time to do this right, to work with the local anglers like at Loch Lomond, who would happily work with the Scottish Government. It's not about making sure we get it perfect, but it is surely about making sure we get it more accurate and better and that requires evidence which is not there. Thank you, Convener. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. Um, I, too, am going to support annulment today with a heavy heart. I believe in the precautionary principle uh, very strongly, and I completely acknowledge the, the respect for anglers and others involved who believe in conservation as well. Um, however, I'm not reassured about the level of, of science-based evidence, and I, I do find that I have a concern about uh, the lack of peer review. I acknowledge that these are difficult issues, but I don't think it's moved forward fast enough, and I, I understand um, that we would revert to the, the previous SSI in the meantime, so we wouldn't be leaving um, Scotland without the serious protection it does need, I think we, if that is correct, I think, um, I, I, I'm prepared to be um, <laughs> corrected on that, but if that's correct, I think it's important that we do move forward taking stakeholders with us and that there is a great deal to do. Thank you. Mark Roscoe. Thanks, Kabina, and um, I'd like to thank Jackie Bailey and Liz Smith and the associations for um, coming to committee and really really providing a lot of the, the detail uh, here, which has enabled us to test this, uh, this order to destruction. Um, I think to a certain extent we are where we are uh, with the state of the salmon stocks and our rivers in Scotland. Um, and I think, you know, even on uh, rivers which have a particularly high grading, grade one rivers, the vast majority of anglers are, are still catching and releasing. Um, so on that basis, I think it's important that the gradings of these rivers um, are accurate they do actually reflect the science um, and you know it, it's been uh, i think heartening to hear how the scientific model is improving um, particularly the uh, you know the, the evolution of the model to include better and more data on eggs and uh, juveniles and the i think the important commitment given today that there will be robust peer review of this particularly being brought in place um, for next year um, I think it's disappointing that we still have a situation where we don't know uh, who actually owns the salmon rights on a lot of the rivers. Um, I, think, I think that is a concern and indeed could be a barrier to, to making the science even more robust if you can't get access to the, uh, to the rivers to improve the model. Um, I think that at the end of the day, um, the precautionary principle has to win out here um, because of the state of, of the stocks um, that we have in our rivers in Scotland. And on that basis, I won't be voting for the motion to annul. Um, Angus MacDonald. OK, thanks, um, convener. I, I can certainly understand the concerns of uh, a number of angling clubs that have been raised this morning and uh, in previous correspondence. However, I also understand uh, the Scottish Government's stance, and I'm sure it's, uh, it isn't taking these uh, conservation measures for the fun of it um, or to be awkward. For, for me, this is... Uh, a no pain, no gain scenario, and, it's, and let's not forget um, there was a, a very real and imminent threat in 2016. It's important to remember why we're uh, here and, and at this stage. Action had to be taken to avoid EU infraction proceedings, uh, as the Cabinet Secretary stated in her opening remarks. Now, granted, um, there's an argument to say it was rushed to a degree in 2016, but the, the Scottish Government was effectively uh, bounced into taking the measure. Um, if the motion to annul this instrument is passed today, will we not just be back to square one and be putting uh, previous conservation measures uh, at risk? Uh, and of course, let's not forget the salient point that was made last week, that uh, uh, salmon numbers will increase if, uh, as a result of downgradings of category one or two to category three. So to pick up on um, one of the Cabinet Secretary's earlier points, um, to paraphrase, I, I think we have to be careful what we wish for, otherwise we may end up 
uh, in a situation like Ireland, uh, and that's surely not what anybody wants. So I'll be uh, voting to oppose the uh, motion to annul. Thank you. Uh, Alex Rowley. Either whether the motion is passed or not, I do hope that the Cabinet Secretary will recognise that there has been a fair bit of concern raised here <coughs> that last week based on the evidence and this week. And there is a wider concern out there. I think we would all take the issue seriously in terms of Scotland's rivers and, and the, the health in this salmon. Uh, but I do think I do think that there needs to be far better engagement with anglers and with associations. They cannot be seen as the problem. They've got to be surely seen as part of the solution. And I think there is a real weakness there. Uh, I think it's important that that we get that message out. That's why I will support the the motion that's come brought forward today. But either way, no matter how that, that goes, I do think there's a real message here. Uh, and more needs to be done. And if that means we need more resources, then then you need to be saying so. But, but I, I think the committee generally has not been happy with the evidence last week and the, the discussions today. Uh, John McAlpine. Thank you very much. Um, I, I've got a great deal of sympathy um, with angling clubs around Scotland. Um, as got a lot of anglers and uh, other fishermen in my own area. But as I said in my comments to the Minister, it, you know, it works both ways. The, the NIF has resulted in it's got a Category 1 as a result of its catch and release policy. And indeed, I, I believe in terms of its improved uh, modelling and, and counting methods and management. Uh, and if, uh, as, if this was uh, annulled today, um, the NIF would go back to being a category two and I know that the, a lot of the expectations of local people of improvements in tourism and the strong message that being a category one sends out uh, would be lost and it also seems to me that um, if, you, if you go back to the previous SSI, if your arguments are that you have concerns about uh, the data uh, now, why would you go back to the previous situation when you, presumably by the same logic, uh, the data was worse? I mean, I accept that data needs to improve. We've had a wide-ranging discussion around that uh, today. I don't think the way is, um, is is to go back the way. I think we need to keep continue the engagement, uh, continue to improve modelling. Uh, but for those reasons, uh, I will be vote voting against the annulment today. Thank you. Uh, John Scott. Um, thank you very much, uh, convener. And I speak in support of the motion to, to annul this instrument. I support the precautionary principle and all that Mark Ruskell has said in this regard, but I'm afraid I don't feel that the science is sufficiently robust and it affects too many lives. There's an awful lot of decisions um, and lives affected by this essentially almost arbitrary decision. So, in my view, I think we should... Uh, annul this instrument. I think we should re-examine the data and come back with another instrument based on perhaps a different, perhaps even a better interpretation of the science available to us, but perhaps a more realistic understanding and evaluation of the inadequate science that's available to us. Uh, thank you, Mr Scott. Kate Forbes. Just to add a few points, um, whilst I appreciate the evidence that Jackie Bilia and Liz Smith have provided, I think it's worth remembering that as somebody who represents quite a lot of rivers, none of, well, very few of whom have actually raised concerns, that it is just a few rivers that have serious concerns about this, or at least have flagged it, which is why I would be far more in favour of tightening up the process for appeals um, and looking at the methodology for next year than supporting the motion to annul the legislation. Um, I think that those concerns that have been raised are uh, legitimate and who knows what rivers will be concerned in subsequent years. But as it stands, I do think that uh, it is a small number of rivers that have raised specific concerns um, that, and that, have been, that have been raised at this committee. Does any other member wish to comment? Finlay Cars. Yeah, I just want to put on record, this, this is a very difficult decision um, because obviously it will have an impact on some of my constituents, both on the Nith, but equally so on the Bladnock, where uh, they're going to move to a Category 3. 
Um, the status quo is absolutely not acceptable, where we have angling clubs in, in effect almost competing for um, a river characterisation which is not based on uh, what most angling and, and river boards consider as pure science. Um, something needs to change. Uh, the, the difficult thing is how we send that message out. I would, like, I would like to have had some more guarantees from the Scottish Government of how we're going to move forward. Uh, but on the basis of the evidence I've heard from angling associations and, and round the table today, I'll be moving, I'll be uh, uh, supporting the annulment. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, like, like others, I have concerns about the level of data <laughs> informing these categorisations. Uh, but I remind colleagues, these are conservation measures one of a number being utilised. And like Mark Crosco, I, I do believe the precautionary principle uh, overrides everything. Uh, the committee in its recent report on the environmental impacts of salmon farming bemoaned the apparent absence of the precautionary principle being at play as that sector expanded and called on that to be front and centre going forward. Whatever legitimate reservations we have about the accuracy of some of the the basis for the decision contained in this instrument, surely that approach needs to apply here also. Uh, it's also the case that these proposals do not stop angling. They merely stop the killing of fish. Uh, pick up on Kate uh, Forbes's point. I, I note that there are a number of rivers that have gone from Grade 1 to Grade 3 and appear to have accepted this. I think the vast majority of anglers get that these measures are needed. Uh, given that and the commitments we've had around um, the changes in the approach to the science and around peer reviewing, I would not support the motion to annul. However, picking up on, on Alec Rowley's point about if, if the decision of the committee is not to support the motion to annul, we do need to see improvement in approach going forward. And like Kate Forbes, I would like to see, and I place this on the record, that as the science and the data improves, so we eventually establish a formal right of appeal, because I think that brings more equity, greater equity to this whole process, albeit it will have to be founded in the, the science. Uh, so on that note, Cabinet Secretary, can I invite you to respond to the debate? Yes, I, I don't want to rehearse all the discussions that have taken place. Uh, about the development of the science over a number of years, the development of the model over a number of years, and both of those things will continue uh, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to happen. Um, uh, I, I find it difficult, I don't come from a science background, being drawn into uh, uh, um, discussions about science at this level. I'm impressed and uh, surprised at the level of scientific knowledge uh, claimed by so many committee members. Uh, can I just gently point out that with science, other scientific opinions are always available um, and it is always a balance uh, between those and, uh, 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 and that is just, that's something that will never change. Um, I have indicated that I will provide the existing peer review data that we have for the, the generalised model that we use because we know that there is peer review data for that. Um, I, I hear and acknowledge um, and will uh, make sure that peer review data for the more specific tweaked version uh, is also available. But I think having the background peer review um, uh, information is also uh, going to be uh, very good. Um, I should say that I utterly refute the notion that somehow this is an arbitrary um, exercise. There's nothing arbitrary about the exercise at all. Um, uh, uh, the decisions are, are made uh, on uh, uh, what we take to be the real understanding of what is happening in, in our rivers and the changes that are taking place in our rivers. I would just reiterate what I've said on a number of occasions this morning. Angling is not banned on any river. Angling can continue. It is the taking of a fish and killing it that may be banned on some rivers. So. I think we just need to be clear what it is we're actually talking about. I also want to confirm that if these regulations were to be annulled, then we would simply revert to the position for the 2017 season. And that would mean that the killing of fish could take place on 49 rivers where we believe that it is not sustainable and could damage the health of salmon on that river. Anglers would be able to kill and keep salmon caught in four special areas of conservation, which we consider should be catch and release fisheries. So there are some real issues there in terms of uh, uh, Habitats Directive. 
and annulment would unfairly impact river systems where the gradings have risen for 2018, as they would remain catch and release, despite the fact that our assessment is that the, the health of those rivers had gotten to a point where they could go to a, a, a grade one, and that's the River Clyde, uh, the North US Lochs, and we've already heard about the River Nith uh, um, uh, as well. So people need to understand what the reality of this means if these regulations this year are annulled, and I would strongly request that the committee do not proceed down that road. Okay. Uh, Liz Smith, uh, to wind up and indicate whether you wish to press or withdraw the motion. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, I would like to say that I think the first job of any committee in the parliament is to ensure that we scrutinise policy decision making and that obviously the most important part of that is to ensure that we have a good uh, evidence base. And I must congratulate this committee on um, the, uh, the fact that I think you have worked very hard to ensure that the evidence base uh, is accurate. Um, I, I followed this um, with considerable interest, not just because of the approaches that I've had in, the, in my uh, local area, but um, like the Cabinet Secretary, I'm not a scientist, but I have gone into very considerable detail uh, on some of the points that have been uh, issued to me by people who I consider to be uh, experts in the field. And I think it's very clear that they are pointing out to very significant problems uh, within uh, the, the data, that it is not sufficiently scientifically robust. And I think whether or not uh, the motion uh, to annul is successful or not, I think that's the key point. There are very considerable issues about the data that is being used. But I would like to press my annulment. The question, therefore, is that motion S5M11020 in the name of Liz Smith is agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. All those in favour of the motion to annul, indicate, please. Right. Okay. 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 Uh, those against the motion to annul. And has there any abstentions? There are no abstentions. The result is five votes in favour for the motion to know, six votes against. Uh, that's the result. Can I uh, seek the agreement from the committee for the convener to approve the final report to Parliament? Uh, recording that. Thank you. I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary and her officials for their attendance. Uh, at its next meeting on 27th March, the committee will take oral evidence from the Committee on Climate Change and will also hear from stakeholders on the Scottish Crown Estate Bill. I, uh, the committee will now move into private session and I ask that the public gallery be cleared. <laughs>